Well, hello, hello everyone. My name is Dan here with Treebeard Book Reviews, and I'm joined by Jonathan. Hey everyone, I'm Jonathan from Words in Time, and we are very excited to talk to our good friend, author of the Sun Eater series, Christopher Rocchio. How are you today, Christopher? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, guys. If you were well, to rate your day on a star rating from on one to five, rating. how's it going? Oh man, uh, honestly, it's probably a three. It's been a long day, but this is the highlight of it. So um, All right, I'm we'll, we'll see if we can bump that up by the end. Yeah, of the let's see if we can yeah. get it to at least yeah, a we four. Can boost those numbers for sure, for sure. That could go down. So yeah, fingers we might, crossed. We, 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 we might be getting a TripAdvisor <laughs> review after this, Jonathan. <laughs> oh man, Do not no, recommend. No, All right, so I guess we're going to be here, guys. We're going to be talking about the Sun Eater series by Christopher. Um, we're going to go into, you know, asking Christopher some questions that Jonathan and I have written down or that some of our subscribers have submitted to us on my Discord or through Jonathan, through your channel. And uh, we are going to be having a spoiler section. We will warn you. You'll be well warned that we're going to get into full spoilers, everything that's published by Christopher. And uh, Christopher, I think you have a big announcement that's going to be coming out, uh, a new book coming out this month. If you can tell us a little bit about that first. Oh, uh, yeah. So Kingdoms of Death, which is hiding behind me, uh, I put it in the wrong part of the uh, the counter, is uh, book four in the series. Uh, and it is coming out on the 22nd of March. It will be available uh, in, uh, in English, the U.S. and the U.K., wherever books are sold, or U.K. and, and, and former imperial territories, uh, the Commonwealth. Uh, and so it will be available uh, wherever books are sold. Uh, the audiobook should be out on the same day uh, as well. Uh, you know, fingers crossed on that one. But uh, but yeah, so that'll be out uh, end of the month. So it's getting close. Very exciting, very exciting times. I'm wearing my well, Kingdoms of Death themed outfit, Mike. Trying to match the colors the with the new book. Oh, nice. Well, I wore black just for that because I, I have started Kingdoms of Death. I have the arc, uh, so I have been reading it. I'm about uh, ten percent in. Uh, there will be a link in the description below, guys. If you want to pre-order Kingdoms of Death, please do. Um, I actually gonna have two copies, so I have my copy there, and I have ordered a copy from Quail Ridge. I'll put a link to Quail Ridge below. Um, and if you put a comment in there, you can get a signed copy from Christopher. So please do that. Yeah, yeah. There's a section. So Quail Ridge Books is my local independent store here in Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, I have a standing thing with them. I will sign books. Uh, you can even go and order the older books in the series right now. Just fill out the other comments section during checkout saying you'd like me to sign your copy. They'll let me know to come on into the store. It may take me a couple days, uh, but I will I will get the book signed and they'll get them on their way to you. So uh, please do. Please do. If you're going to pre-order the book, consider uh, supporting a local business, at least my local business. No. That's awesome. I like how Dan's flexing with his Kingdoms of Death copy in the background. Meanwhile, I'm traveling, visiting my wife's family at the moment. So I've got like a medical journal, uh, a golf courses of South Carolina. Uh, <laughs> Not well, quite I didn't the room, so uh, you you got me beat. So. Does uh, does can, the bed have like little, star little patterns little on it there, Jonathan, or is that like a moon on the bed? Is that like a like a solar pattern on it? They are seashells. It's it's oh, uh, okay. Seventies beach chic is what yeah. I've been told. Awesome. Well, I love it. Yeah, no, I had to like. Well, I was carrying them all down the stairs. I'm like, these these are heavy, Christopher. These books, they aren't light. I almost died going down two flights of stairs with these books. That's all part of my plan. I'm trying to assassinate all of my fans. <laughs> all your readers. Yeah. Uh, no, it's it's getting awkward. I did a, a – when the third one came out, my wife made me hold them all like this and, and take a picture. It's going to become impossible to do that picture. So um, <laughs> we're getting close. If, if not this, book five's out in December. And that'll definitely, you know, exceed my well, ability. Like, you have Jump to like do the whole thing. Like, have you seen my uh, my books? It's this big, and I lost it over here. Like, yeah, I'm sort of <laughs> flexing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, well I, that's I, a very that's a very long term workout plan. Yeah, You're like I'm not gonna sign out of a gym. I'm not gonna purchase dumbbells. I'm just gonna spend years of my life crafting, cultivating, writing, publishing very thick novels, and I will right. carry and them around until flexing. I get buff. So, <laughs> well, I finished Demon in White last week, and uh, like I read the the hardcover edition, and uh, I remember I put it down on my coffee table and went like thunk, and then my wife texted me from up. She's like, "What the heck was that noise?" I'm like, "Oh, I, I put down my book." <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, the funny thing about that is it's still shorter than all of the Game of Thrones books. It's just you know, the way it's printed; it, it just looks a little bit longer than it maybe. Yeah, well, the the print is actually a nice size on it. I will say, like for the hardcover editions, 
they're really enjoyable to read just the size of the print and even though they are a little bit bigger like uh i never felt um like they were too big so i will um i will commend you on that and your publisher on that so why don't we start rolling into some questions so jonathan do you want to start us off with any questions you have burning sure i was just gonna say this is why i'm team mass market paperback gang because i like to read in bed when i'm uh, i at the end of the day no longer looking at screens read a nice book and if I get tired and I accidentally drop that book, that sound that you just made of dropping the book, that would be my face. But with a mass market paperback, well, yeah. The thing with a hardcover is if you drop it on your face, you go straight to sleep instantly. So, <laughs> like, you don't, like, no worries there. So, fair, uh, fair enough. Uh, well, talking about the length of the books, a question um, that I had, uh, Christopher, it is, is that intentional or is that, like asking how long is a piece of string like do you have a length in mind that you write to and then a follow-up question how easy is it to stick to that do you do you find yourself writing well beyond that and needing to edit down or are you pretty good at kind of hitting the, the target that you've set for yourself well so that's an interesting question right because i don't think it's either of those uh, i know usually to within like plus or minus three uh how many chapters are going to be in the book by the time i finish the outline um, that changes sometimes. Demon and White, I think, gained more chapters than any of the other books did. Uh, you know, and and, um, and so I know roughly how long my uh, how long my chapters are. They're approximately three to four thousand words long. Some of them are going to be a little longer if they're really complicated. If there's a lot of stuff that has to happen, and it's appropriate for that to be one chapter. Um, so there are, and some are really short too, right? If they're traveling somewhere, it might be short. Mm -hmm. But on average, it works out to about 3,500 words a chapter. So if I know, hey, there are 80 chapters in the book, then I know approximately how long the book is, which is which will let me predict, usually to within a pretty good margin, uh, how long the whole project's going to take. And I can maybe be within a couple weeks, you know, of of, uh, of my guess by the time I'm done. Um, that's worked out pretty well on most of the books so far um kings of death in particular was a little bit complicated that one got split in half and even before then it was it was a bit more of a slog uh for me to get through than some of the others so i was having a lot of, of shorter days because i'll reliably write a thousand words a day minimum uh but i can write as much as like i think i think my record is is nine thousand in a day that has only happened like four or five times in my life but usually it's in like the 2000 words a day range. And so I can, I can estimate how long my projects are going to take and how, how much, uh, you know, uh, wordage there will be by the end. But, uh, you know, every now and then, you know, something ends up, uh, you know, taking like a chapter that I thought wouldn't be complicated ends up being complicated. And so we've got an extra, you know, three, 4,000 words I wasn't expecting. And that adds a few signatures to the final uh, print uh, of the book, right? Because you have to add uh, pages and sets of 16, right? So, you know, the books get a little bit longer. And, and so it's it's usually, um, you know, there's a little bit of, of play in the joints, but I, I do know that I'm writing a long book when I start, right? Because uh, again, I know the length of the chapters. And if I know I'm aiming at an 80 chapter book, I know it's going to be the size of Demon and White, approximately. Right, and so now that there are some some restrictions that are put on me because of the cost of paper and things like that, I have to think about that in the outline phase and say, okay, this needs to be a fifty chapter book, a sixty chapter book, whatever, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and and so too, right? Because uh, I've been thinking about like next phase after after Hadrian. I know the books need to get shorter because of these practical limitations I've been given, right? Mm -hmm. And so that means I need to be looking at like. Tell, finding stories that I can tell in, you know, 40 chapters or 35 or whatever, right? And and figuring that all out in the planning phase is one of those reasons that I'm, I'm a big advocate for outlining is that uh, there's obviously the business angle here too, right? And that gets lost a lot of times, I think, in all the talk about art, um, you know, that, that art is here subject to, you know, material limitations, right? um you know with regards to things like paper cost and, and distribution and, and weight shipping weight right these are all things that impact the publishing industry and so thinking about that early on in the process means that you guys aren't getting a book that has been ruined right by these external factors right and is instead working within the box right because 
actually, if you have if you have to work inside of a box, you have to get really creative about how you use the space in okay. that box, right? And and I think some of the best work you can do is when you have those limitations. So I, I'm interested in like uh, a puzzle solving way with dealing with these sorts of things. Like I guess more. I have two follow up questions to that then, mm -hmm. uh, Christopher. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned that you do outline. Uh, you're an outline writer. So like, what does that writing process look like? And um, like how many, and then at the end of the stage, at the end of that outlining, how many drafts do you go through at the editing? And I guess uh, the last thing, and I'll, I can remind you about it is, uh, when were you told that you had to split books uh, four and five and how did that affect that writing process? Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Um, so to do this in reverse, I guess, I was told uh, to do the split in September last year. So this was well after, it was, it was uh, six or seven months after I turned the manuscript in. So I hadn't looked at or really thought about book four, what was then book four is now books four and five in like half a year. I'd been working on some other things. Um, and so it was, it was a little bit of a trip to get back into it. Uh, and then I, I ended up, what I did was I, there's a really obvious, I, and I think with you guys read Kingdom to Death here in a couple of weeks, where it ends, I think is actually a pretty obvious place to end. And so I ended up really just slapping the extra closing page on the book, basically. There's a little bit of reworking that had less to do with the split and more to do with general pacing that I had to do on what is now Kingdom to Death. So it's basically the same. Uh, and then it's book five that didn't really have a first act because it had been the middle of the book, right? And right. when we talk about, you know, first acts, people tend to think in terms of plot structure, but they're also pacing considerations, right? And if you start reading a book and it feels like you're starting in the middle, just in terms of pacing and flow, you're not going to have a really great time. Something's going to feel kind of off. So mostly for pacing reasons, I, I went back through and, and restructured what was at the beginning of the book five, half of that initial draft and uh, sort of smooth things over. And so it came, this, this, this news obviously came really late in the process. I would have liked to know before I started, right? Ideally, but it can't always happen that way. Uh, but it still uh, managed to, to be carried off in such a way. I think that if you don't know the books were cut in half, you probably will never really notice. Uh, and so I think people will be, pretty happy, uh, except for the fact that the book is is obviously a little short, uh, which is, of course, disappointing. I know some people like like to get their wrist workouts or whatever, but, uh, you know, that uh, they can do that on their own time. Do you, do you think if, for some reason, uh, retroactively, you had to split one of the earlier books that you would have been able to find a similar point? Or do you think it was kind of a, a fortunate coincidence that you had kind of a very natural breaking point for Kingdoms of Debt? I think I got really lucky in this case. I think I could do it. Um, Demon and White in particular has like a lot of little, I won't call them vignettes, but it has a lot of little micro stories, little arcs, I guess. Mm -hmm. We were talking in terms of like, <laughs> like manga, right? There are a lot of like episodic little adventures and we could theoretically, I could have broken. We, we call that an emotional roller coaster, Christopher, I, this Christopher, I think, with Demon and White. Um, oh, yeah, well, yeah. That's what I would call it. Uh, <laughs> There's various levels of screaming. Yeah. Uh, but there are, um, but there are, there are probably places, right? The thing is, right, like, you want a work of art to be itself, right? Like, whatever the best form of itself is, right? And so if I'm told midway through a process that this book now needs to be two, then I want each of those books to be the best they can be as individual books, right? I don't want to do the thing where you feel like you've been sold half a product, right? Because that's lame, uh, you know? Uh, and so I, uh, I worked really hard to make sure that each of these, these have sort of feels, I think, coherent and, and whole. Um, the one notable exception, and this is a little bit of, a, I guess, a teaser, is not a time skip between four and five. Uh, because mm -hmm. there can't be. Uh, it's a little obvious, maybe, but there isn't mm -hmm. one, uh, which is a little bit of a change, right? So, uh, so that's really the only like weird artifact of, of this having been done, and um, and yeah. So to get back to the point about outlining, as far as what they look like, mine are really, really involved. Um, I, I, there, so the uh, the outline for like Howling Dark was sixty something pages, and that single space. So I think there were more words in that outline than there were in Harry Potter book one. <laughs> um, 
which which makes it sound, I think, a, like a little bit more work than it actually is, because when you're not writing for an audience, it's a lot easier to write, right? Mm. I think a lot of I think a lot of writer's block comes from the expectation that you are, are going to look bad, right? If it's not perfect, right? And if you're There's just no like, resolution on page four of this word document. Yeah, no. Of course someone to read, if someone to read this page, they would be entirely unsatisfied. Well, right, I think that's why, to... like, some of my favorite authors, like like yourself and like you know Brandon Sanderson, and they don't let the perfect get in the way of the good. And uh, you know, your books, I find, I think your books are great, and uh, like I said, you're fastly becoming one of my favorite authors. But um, what you know, I really kind of appreciate that that you know you you can recognize that in your writing that you know you can put a pin it in and say, this is good enough for the story I'm trying to tell. I think really appreciate that. And you're not just getting caught up in that, uh, in that, uh, you know, that producing the best art where you can. And how, so how do you get around that type of a barrier and uh, knowing when to um, say this is done? So I don't really know that I have an answer for that one because it's not something that I really think about very consciously. Uh, I do hate That's editing. good. We shouldn't have put it in his head. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah now, now, I'm, now I'm ruined. Um, we're, never, we're never getting book six. It's, yeah, it's over. Uh, but, uh, no, it, it's um, it's not something. Uh, it's not something that I think about very consciously because I think mostly I don't like editing. Uh, I uh, this is one of the reasons I outline is so that I don't mm. get as lost in the weeds. Right, I tend to think of my outlines as very low resolution first drafts. Mm. Uh, which is a phrase that I've used probably a lot. So if anyone's heard me talk about outlining before, I apologize. But uh, like I said, the the uh, the the expectation that you need to get everything spit polished and waxed and, and perfect, right, uh, on, um, on, on in the outline is silly, right? Because nobody's ever going to see the outline. So you can mm -hmm. get a lot of things like plot taken care of. And so by the time I actually start writing, writing, like I don't need to think about plot anymore. Plot's been solved because plot's mm -hmm. all in the Right. And that leaves me time to focus on character and, you know, mood and, and on the prose itself and things like that. Cause I don't need to worry about where I'm going. Cause I, mm -hmm. I think another large proportion of uh, writer's block for a lot of, especially aspiring writers is down to having simply failed to plan. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you don't know like what scene you're writing as you're writing it, you can't possibly write it. Right. And mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of writers just sort of do the stream of consciousness thing. Um, and at least the ones that I've spoken to who will will uh, say that their, their method is stream of consciousness will also immediately admit that they write microfiction uh, because they haven't planned far enough to write anything longer. I'm not saying there aren't people who, you know, can't write a book totally. Uh, I believe Stephen King does. Um, but he's probably doing a lot of planning subconsciously, uh, you know, that, that isn't, uh, you know, being externalized into an album, right? And obviously, you know, a man's pro has written a bajillion books and... Yeah, he's got 50 years of experience on most writers in the craft. Right, and so I think a lot of people who think they need to emulate that technique out the gate are missing the part where they're not Stephen King, right? <laughs> Uh, you know, I certainly am not right. I, I don't have the same method at all. And I, 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 I usually try to tell people who are trying to write, you know, who will say, you know, Newman advice, right, that you need to find out what your process is and, and differentiate that from what other people are telling you to do, right? Because those are very different things. I, I don't usually like how to write books because they're only telling you how someone else writes. And is there really, any elements? Sorry, Chris Rinner. Is there any no, elements no. of discovery writing in some of your uh, your chapters? Because, like, so like, say you're in the book, and then you're like, okay, now where Hadrian is at in his life, would he make this decision now, or would he? Yeah, totally, uh, totally, right. Because this is the other thing too. I think people are afraid of outlining because they think that they have to become enslaved to it, right? Mm -hmm. But the outline is a tool, and it's your tool, and you created it, right? And so uh, there's a bit in Demon and White where, without being too specific, um, Hadrian has to deal with the Inquisition, right? I think it's like three or four chapters. Totally didn't outline it. I just got there and realized I'd forgotten about the Inquisition <laughs> and they would have something to say uh, about the things that were going on. And so I sort of on the fly improvised this little arc that got added into the book, right? And I think it really, uh, I think it was really good because those ideas that you have really spontaneously and in the moment are often uh, the ones that are most worth exploring. Um, but there are also times where I'll have that idea and it's really complicated. And so I'll need to sort of uh, plan out how to make the addition, right? So uh, again, with Demon Light, 
there's a, a battle towards the end of the book um, where I uh, realized the mechanics of the battle were more complicated than I had given them credit for in my initial outline, right? There were, you know, elements of the battle that I just hadn't put in my outline, uh, despite knowing about. And so I threw out the last, you know, half dozen or so chapters of, of my outline and re-outlined what was left to account for the things that I had not been thinking about. And so you don't have to, you know, be a, a, a slave to your own method, right? You can, uh, totally take a step back and try something new. Um, but you just need to, you need to be kind of deliberate about what you're doing. I think, um, you know, it feels and, kind of like a, what you're describing seems kind of like it in a, in a game, like, uh, say a game of football, if you have a game plan and sometimes it breaks down and someone's scrambling and improvising, it ends up being the most like memorable play. And then sometimes it works out. But if you go into that, trying to do that on every play, yeah, it, it might work out. I mean, obviously writing, there's not so much winning and losing. It's more of a style choice. But for, it sounds like for newer writers, that's going to be something that's harder to pull off than if they had a plan. Yeah, uh, I think I think that's a really good analogy because uh, you could totally it, it's that that the sort of uh, mimetic definition of insanity, right? Is doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. And if if you're if you're writing and writing and writing and not completing stories, then you're not writing correctly for you, right? Whatever that may be, right? And, and so, um, like, Empire of Silence wasn't outlined, and it took like four times longer for me to write that book than it had any of the other ones. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, I started outlining on book two because they gave me a deadline. Oh, can you believe it? Uh, and, um, and so I needed to really, audacity. Yeah, it's ridiculous. They expect me to do, do work. Don't they know this is art? Uh, which is of course a, another whole problem, right? There are people who think that because it's art, it shouldn't be, you know, uh, there shouldn't be these external constraints at all, right? Which can be troubling. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, they wanted a, they wanted a new book, you know, in a year. And so, uh, you know, I had to figure out how to make that happen. And for me, that was developing, you know, a, a method for outlining, uh, which has been really, really helpful. And I, I think it even shows in the books as, as proud as I am of book one, uh, I really am proud of book two, uh, because it's the first one where I, I really, I feel classed up as a, as a writer and, and then like had to do it professionally. Book one is underrated. Book, <laughs> book one, underrated. I, you heard it from Christopher. All these people say, oh, book one's good. Book two, book two and three, whole other level. It's like, yes, they are amazing. All right. Demon and White was my number one book I read in 2021. Absolutely loved it. Thanks, man. Um, but Empire of Silence, I mean, they're all they're all very close. They're I, all I, so I, close. Like it's, but the, the thing is, like they're so they're all so good, but they keep getting better, which is like. I'm really nervous. I'm really nervous, mostly about like getting a micro step down at this point, because like I'm I'm mostly worried about something like ah, oh, book four was okay. It was it's not as good as book three. And uh, I don't know if I'm ready for those reviews. Yeah, so, uh, Jake, uh, I think Jake Bishop gave uh, Damon and White a 9.5 and a Kingdoms of Death of a 9.4. I was like, that's it. Cancel the pre-order. He, yeah. he hasn't <laughs> taken the trend. A 9.4. trash. <laughs> he's out there traumatizing me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's I don't the think thing. You like, have to worry about that. The thing with these, no, you won't have to worry about that. Like, I've, I've been, I've been, I've been I'm like I said, I'm 10% into KOD right now. And I've been sweating. Like, let's think of your books. Like, I find when I'm reading, I've never held my breath so much when I'm reading. And I'm like, I was like, oh. And my wife's like, you're <laughs> gasping when you're reading this book. I'm like, it's so good. That's why. <laughs> like, That's, awesome. That's not bad for a memoir, right? So, uh... it's no honestly because yeah, we're like just that's a quote growth, for the next though. book like so so good it gave me health issues like, okay. <laughs> my, my i now have is sleep apnea your... because of christopher yeah. <laughs> uh you sent me your fitbit graph reading the end of, of death and i was like yeah. oh I'm sorry <laughs> oh Didn't... well when howling dark when i had like 120 pages left and it was like 11 o'clock at night i'm like okay i'll i'll read 20 more pages and i'll go to bed and then i was like I'm gonna be up all night now, and then I, I stayed up to like four, three a.m. in the morning, and I had to finish it. So I, I think always that's... feel bad when people tell me that. <laughs> I'm sorry about your sleep. It's okay. Um, it was worth the same it. thing happened to me. I was reading the end of like of Halleck Talk. My wife was asleep, and I was just like, I gotta, I gotta tell. Hey, hey, <laughs> I, I have to tell somebody. <laughs> 
I, I was reading it in bed too, like I said, and I actually, okay, I, I left my bedroom and I went downstairs to my living room and I just sat on the couch and I'm like, just, I couldn't put it down. It was amazing. Oh, and I've, I've never, uh, there's not many books where I've done that. And um, that just kind of speaks to like, I mean, Jonathan, I, I can safely say that Sun Eater is my favorite sci-fi series of all time right now. And uh, I know you alluded to that in some of your videos, Jonathan. No, I hate it. This is this is a good cop, bad cop setup. <laughs> well, I yeah. have grievances, Christopher. Um, I want my phone call. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean it's so uh, it's interesting how sci-fi tends to have less series mm -hmm. than fantasy. My theory is that because I've read a little bit of fantasy, but I'm I'm focusing on sci-fi at the moment. But it seems that fantasy writers put so much time into their world building their magic system their characters that you cannot explore all of, all of that in one book and and that's why series are quite common whereas sci-fi it's not that you can't do the same with sci-fi but often sci-fi is driven by the idea the theme the concept a technology so mm -hmm. in terms of sci-fi series i actually don't have a super even though i mostly read sci-fi i don't have a super long list of favorite so, Probably Hyperion Cantos would be mm. uh, right at the very top of that, yeah, and yeah. yeah, alongside it, uh, Sun Eater. So I feel I feel equally Dan. Um, yeah, me and me and Dan Simmons. I'm a good company. Um, I really <laughs> I really like those books too. Uh, so that's cool. I just I just started yeah. Hyperion on audiobooks. I've been listening to that while I'm walking the dog. Poor dog keeps. It's just probably freezing because I'm like, oh, I want to listen to more Hyperion. And the dog's like, take <laughs> me home. I'm cold. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's awesome! If only the yeah. audiobook walked in, worked indoors. Yeah, no, they disappear <laughs> <laughs> when you when you cross the threshold. Yeah. Uh, well, it's hard to listen to when I have ki kids are running around like, "Daddy, talk to me." I'm like, oh, okay." <laughs> yeah, my, my... I, I love my kids, just not as yeah. much as Sunny. <laughs> That's why I have protective covers on my book because I have young children. And if they mangle one of my books, I'll be so upset. So I'm like, I, first thing I did when I got like all my my book covers, I'm like, okay, these are precious. These are going in slip cases. So yeah, I need to do that. Honestly, the whole collection isn't isn't uh, protected, so I should. I will on. say it is the best thirty dollars I ever spent on getting some <laughs> slip cases. So I was going to ask about unreliable narration. Mm. How how reliable of a narrator is Hadrian. Ah, uh, now that would be telling, right? Um, okay, so we can save no, the section to later. No, no, uh, no. It's 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 not really a spoiler or anything like that. It is. It's just hard to quantify, right? Because like, what do you mean by unreliable narrator? I think when people hear that, they mostly think, you know, is this person lying to me willfully? and maliciously. I don't think Hadrian's that. Uh, I do think that he is a person and that he has some limited perspectives, uh, maybe ideologically, certainly psychologically, right? You know, he can't be everywhere at once. Uh, and he might not understand other people on their own terms, right? Because none of us, you know, is really good at that. Some of us, you know, may be better than others and some of us pretend that we're better than others. Uh, but uh, if you look at the other point of view characters that intersect with him, right, if you read the short stories or the novellas, right, there's usually some some disjunction there. And it's not necessarily that they're disagreeing on events, but they're disagreeing on causes of events or you know, motivations, right, and things like that. And so Hadrian is giving you, I think, the truth as he understands it or as it is in his own head, which may correspond with the absolute and objective truth in some ways and not in other ways. And that's more interesting to me than uh, a character that's just going to lie, right? Uh, and so something I want to do sort of long term is is do uh, more stories that interact with Hadrian's perspective, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I, I'm really interested in, in, uh, in history, right? And mm -hmm. if you look at um, primary and secondary sources, right, that you, you find that they will overlap in certain ways, and they won't overlap in other ways, and the question is why? Right. Uh, we have, I think, four biographies of Alexander the Great from the first couple centuries uh, AD. There aren't any that are super, or even the first couple centuries BC, but there aren't any that are super contemporaneous with his life. Mm -hmm. And they uh, they diverge in certain ways. Right. Um, some of them 
uh, don't mention the sort of mythological connection he has with Zeus, where he claims to be a, a, a demigod son of Zeus. Uh, you know, his mother, you know, slept with Zeus as a snake and things like that. It's not referred to in all of them. Well, that's why yeah. Alexander, you see, depicted with a lot of Herculean, um, um, Herculean mementos, covered like the, you know, the lion's mane, because he tried to claim, you know, claim his divinity, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but it's not in all the sources, right? And I can't remember which one, if it's Diodorus or Plutarch or whoever, right? But there's a, there's a bit where he's in Egypt, right? And he wants to go and find this oracle in Siwa, which is out west in the desert, right? And he takes a, takes a force out there to try and get to the oracle. And I think in three of the stories, uh, they finally find the oracle, which is on this oasis, by following some birds. But there's one where he follows a pair of snakes, right? And the snake, right, is is uh, sort of a, a symbol associated with Zeus. So that version obviously disagrees on the facts, but it's it's doing that in a way that's playing up the, the mythological symbolic narrative around Alexander's life. And so being able to do other stories uh, about or alongside Hadrian's story with the short fiction and things, uh, as a way of trying to either uh, build up or undercut his mythology is something that's really interesting to me and something I've only done a little bit of. And that ties into this question of how reliable and how honest uh, mm -hmm. he's being. I personally, you know, like, you know, the big questions are, like, is he making up all the quiet stuff, right? Um, mm -hmm. that, that's the question. I think when people ask that, they're missing the point because if, if he's making it up, right, like, like, um, then what are you reading, right? <laughs> like it's, it's a big not, lie to tell, yeah. Can't like go online and like go and look up the real facts of you know twenty thousand years from the future. Like, they don't exist, right? Hey Dan, um, Google says the snow quiet. <laughs> oh man, game over for us. Let's get the t right. Yeah. So I don't think he's unreliable in that sense, but I do think that he doesn't have a clear sense sometimes of who his friends are really underneath, which is true of all of us. Um, and so often when characters don't fit into the boxes he's expecting, right, or they, they, uh, they act in a way that's surprising to him, um, the explanation for why might not be on the page, right, because it might be something that you need to figure out. Um, and those are like little subtle things, right? Those are not going to impact the overall direction of the narrative. And they may be something that only really like, you know, clicks for somebody on a reread um, because he's not always right about people, right? And he mm -hmm. is maybe being kinder you know in his depictions of his friends because some of them aren't around anymore or like all sorts of reasons right uh and so mm -hmm. trying to control for his emotional life is probably the the best way to think about his unreliableness uh, i would think i tend yeah. to i think be rather uh, likely to believe a character if i like them so you know mm -hmm. if they say something that's obviously illogical. I'll be like, oh, you've got that one wrong. And if it's a character that I know is like a, a, a villainous villain, I'm going to be like, ah, you're not going to trick me. But if I'm if I'm reading a story and I enjoy it, I'm I'm likely to believe them. And I like Hadrian. I think Hadrian mm -hmm. has some flaws. I think he can be immature at times, or has shown perhaps some prejudices. But he's also maturing. He's gone wiser throughout the books. And overall, I, I'm invested in Hadrian. I'm rooting for Hadrian. For sure. So more often than not, if Hadrian says something, I'm like, yeah, okay. And then I read, I could be getting the title wrong. It was in Tales, the short story. Is it The Pits of a Mesh? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, hang on a second. Yeah, they're like, there. This is all <laughs> fake. <laughs> some, of, some of this doesn't add up. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be forced to pick a side here or do some sleuthing <laughs> of my own. Yeah, I haven't I read, read Pits of a Mesh. I want to do more so. stories like that one. Um, so, yeah, different... I like that, how you've kind of created this you know, world of like perspectives and even though I wasn't taking Hadrian word for word, I was a general, generally somewhat going along for with his uh, perspective on the story. And now I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm well, going to be on the lookout for some of these. Yeah. One of the reasons why you build, I'm oh, sorry, Christopher. Oh, no, no, go ahead. I was just thinking, I think one of the reasons why you build so much trust with Hadrian is it's just like, he feels like a real person or, you know, when you're with your friends, you're, you're a different person when you're with a different group, right? You know, you can, your, your personality will change a little bit adapted to the type of group you're with and you know you really feel that when you're with Hadrian you know when he is with Valka or when he is with other characters in like the Red Company or with like say Octavia for example he feels like a different person and he shifts his personality when he's speaking 
to those characters and i and you really feel like he's a real person because he he does this he naturally does this in the pages and i i find it really fascinating how you capture that yeah that's something i'm pretty cognizant of in my own life uh you know because there is a, obviously there's a public facing component of, of 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 my life now right and that's different than how i interact with you know people at home right be that my friends my family my wife whoever right and so it's something i i, I think about a lot right it's 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 often uh it's difficult right because i'm a pretty introverted person it's difficult to go to conventions or speak in front of large groups of people and uh i i used to wait tables and uh my wife laughs at me when i do these interviews when i do live streams in particular uh or when i'm when i'm doing a, an event in the store she's like who is this person i have never met this person before what are you, <laughs> what are you who are you get out of, get, get out of my my husband's face right um tell her to subscribe go to treebeard book reviews words in time get to know us yeah, yeah. <laughs> smash the like button ring the bell as well <laughs> uh <laughs> but yeah you're um, it. <laughs> yeah it, 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 it's it's that behavior right it's the hey everyone you know welcome to the channel mm -hmm. sort of thing thanks for reading my books it's very different than uh i don't know what's for dinner you know like, <laughs> like what do you <laughs> what do you want uh those are very different you know sorts of of scripts right and that's not to say that one is is fake right but like mm -hmm. You know, we 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 have like professional faces, and Hadrian has to wear a professional face in a lot of uh, different professional faces, because uh, he's not the same person like to the aliens either, right? Like mm -hmm. very different, a uh, very different relationship with 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 them, and and so this is just something that I think about a lot because it's something that impacts my life, um, a lot on 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 account of the uh, on account of the writing and having a public image for. To whatever degree that's true right like i'm by no means am i you know uh some sort of superstar but uh e you know even a small amount of, of of that you know really helps crystallize those distinctions between public and private and and that's a big part of the story right because the the uh the galaxy is so formalized right the imperial mm -hmm. social order is so formalized that you really need those rules and those rules are clarifying and they uh, they help people to understand where they are and, and how to behave and things like that. And it's a huge element of the world. Uh, and so it's not just for Hadrian too, right? It, it's for most of the characters have to wear these sorts of masks. Um, and uh, and that's something too with regards to like people who are in power, right? Like it's especially true of those characters. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we don't really get a very clear glimpse at say the emperor, right? Or, or anything like that because he is hidden under not just Hadrian's own distortions, but his own abstractions, right? Because he has to, he has to play the role of emperor like all the time. And boy, that mm -hmm. must not be fun, right? And I, I try to have a lot of sympathy for characters in those positions, even when they're pretty messed up. Um, the emperor is fascinating. He's one of my, he was one of my favorite characters in Demon of White. And uh, how, how, actually, how did you go about writing a character like that or approaching oh. writing in his voice? Uh, with the emperor in particular, I just knew I didn't want to do every other emperor, right? Uh, every like space emperor ever is a terrible person, some sort of Machiavellian, you know, uh, evil wizard, right? He's either Palpatine shooting lightning out of his hands, or he's Ming the Merciless with his, you know, mercilessness. And I didn't want to do that because I, you know, we we have no shortage of evil emperors uh, mm -hmm. in science fiction, and it's. Um, you know, we, we, we keep throwing out a bunch of tropes, right? And uh, people are always throwing out, you know, the chosen one or whatever, right? <laughs> but they're like totally on board with keeping evil emperors and things like that. So I wanted to do something different. And because uh, he's not, he's he's a politician, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's because he's a prisoner of, of his position, right? You know, his people who occupy positions of power are totally trapped by the conventions of those offices, right? And if they're not, they're deeply corrupt, right? And so if you want to write a character who is honestly trying to hold an office like that, then they're totally a prisoner to their expectations of that role, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, I thought that was more interesting than, um, you know, Ming the Merciless and doing that again, right? Because people expected him to be the bad guy, right? Um, and he, just, uh, he, he felt like he had so many layers to him when you when I was reading him, and that was what really just... I was like, oh, I love this character. This character is so fascinating, and he's and I just I want more of him. So, I really do appreciate that. You know, you didn't give us some mustache twirling emperor. He was probably like 
one of my in the top five favorite characters in Demon and White. Well, I have great news. He will be around more. So um, yes. uh, he's not going anywhere. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, no, he's really fun for me, too. Uh, I like I like okay. writing Emperor a lot. Um, some characters about, are like that. Uh, I was just going to say, speaking about kind of uh, – secondary characters or whatever term you want to, to use for them. Uh, someone like a, like a, a Valka or, or a, a Polino or a Lorien, all these characters I feel like are real and I've become connected to, and they have like interesting personalities. How do you, do you have a particular technique or intention for giving characters like this, their own motivations, their own agency while somewhat being, limited by the first person point of view structure? Uh, I, I try to make sure that they've each got, you know, at least a, a scene what's like a really strong moment for them in each book. Um, with Valka, it's obviously gonna be more than one, but, um, but I wanna make sure that the characters that I feel are most important have at least one, one big set. So there are secondary characters that I wish had more time, uh, but you know, the books are already really long. And if I wanted to give people more attention they'd either have to be longer they have to be more books and, and then those external factors come into play and so you have to make some sacrifices but with the ones that you know are really going to matter in some some in some substantive way over time Valk is the big obvious one right you, and then you want to make sure that uh it, it, as you're, i'm outlining i make sure that, that she's got stuff to do right um and that she's contributing even if it's if it's in sort of <laughs> textual you know symbolic ways but she's contributing to the message of the book whatever that may be and, and it's usually like there's a lot of different points that the book is trying to make sort of you know like on an emotional level a lot of notes i want to hit and so some of those notes are are going to require certain characters if i want to say something obviously about romance then it's, it's about the thing right? that's uh who she is to hadrian i mean among other things uh so like if i know that like i want this book to have these notes this character is going to help me hit those notes best. And then also in terms of making them feel distinct, um, I, I just have a really old trick and that's, and that's the one that Homer uses, right? Which is to have these epithets, right? And they'll either have like, the, the Adrian will either have a literal epithet that he uses to refer to someone. Lorian is the good commander, right? Uh, and he will refer to him that way. When I don't want to open the sentence with Lorian said, it will be, you know, the good commander said. Um, or they'll have like a defining, uh, you know, uh, maybe vocal tick or um, like like all of the like Valka and the other Tabros, you all do tis and twases because that's yeah, just, yeah, I like that. That's how the uh, that's how the narrator, uh, the translator into English of these books has decided to account for their accent. Um, you know, or the Jadians will they won't uh, they won't conjugate verbs properly. Uh, <laughs> Right, so like Octavius is the the Amazon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They've all got these little epithets, yeah. or they've got a defining physical trait too, right? Which is usually eyes. I don't know why, but it's it's almost always mm. eyes. I will talk a lot about eyes. Um, Valkas are very distinctive for yeah. technical reasons. Um, so are Hadrian's. Mm -hmm. uh, so are Lorian's, uh, actually, uh, because he's got a genetic issue. But. Um, but yeah, so there'll usually be some sort of thing like that. And that way I'll hit that note frequently so that that feature of the character becomes a pretty solid thing. And it helps sort of, because really readers do most of the actual, like act, you do way more imagining with these books mm -hmm. than I do, right? Uh, I've written, you know, 200, 300,000 words in a book, right? Um, but you are creating a lot of the images and imagining stuff that's off the page, right? So I'm really giving you guys like the tip of the iceberg and I'm leaving it up to you to figure out what the rest of that is. Mm -hmm. It all and, happens in Detroit, right? That's kind yeah, of exactly. Yeah, that's, Picturing. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's all about cars. Uh, <laughs> and, but, uh, but yeah, so like you, you leave the reader to do a lot of the heavy lifting, right? This is why mm. writers like Lois Bujol don't need even a lot of physical description because they realize you can automate a lot of that. Uh, she's realized, you know, you can automate a lot of that. You don't need to dwell on it unless you like want to, right? Uh, which I do. I, I, I like my <laughs> my long poetic, you know, visual descriptions. But you don't. You can trust your reader to figure things out and to imagine things. And so, if you just give them like a little piece, like you know, uh, you know, um, 
you know, Lorian's like colorless everything, right? He's very like very pale, you know, watery kind of guy. Um, then you give them that little note and they, you will kind of generate a person around those little notes. And so as long as I keep hitting these little, these little drum beats, right, every now and then, it makes the character a little more solid each time, as long as you don't overdo it, right? Because you can also mm. totally overdo it. Because um, yeah, you don't want to mess with that canon of that character in that in like the reader's mind. Because I have like a very vivid picture in my mind of what Hadrian looks like and what Vulcan looks like, and I've, I've you're very consistent with sticking to that image. I was going to ask, how much of yourself do you um, do you feel like is in Hadrian? Because I just finished Lesser Devil uh, this afternoon, and uh, cool. And one of the things I was thinking, Hadrian, you know, when I'm reading Hadrian, he doesn't feel like the oldest child. He actually feels like a middle child because he's so melodramatic. And I was going to ask, um, I know you you mentioned in the the, uh, the beginning of uh, Lesser Devil that, you know, this book, you know, to my brothers, I love you. Are you the youngest, middle, oldest? I'm the oldest. Uh, okay. Yeah. I did not expect. Um, my, my next brother and I are with the... Uh, just uh just about a year apart mm. 13 months so it's pretty close uh, Irish is he trying there. to take what's rightfully yours christopher uh <laughs> no uh, <laughs> uh no but we, we were um we we're pretty close i don't know uh we are pretty close but i um i don't really know that's a hard one right because i have been writing some version of the story some version of this character since i was really little and so it's hard to say how much of Hadrian is me, right? Because it's certainly not a self-insert, right? Mm. But, uh, but or how much is just the fact that I've grown up with this character and we are very close friends, right? Mm. Uh, which is sort of a weird way to think about it, right? But like, obviously, I know Hadrian to the extent that he's, you know, a real person better than anybody else does, right? And so, like, we are functionally like it's it's like we're friends, right? Which is like a weird, silly way to think about it, but. Um, when you have a close friend, right, you tend to pick up personality traits, mannerisms, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and I think to an extent that's a little, that's a two-way street, right? Uh, even with fictional characters, which is really weird. Uh, <laughs> like really weird. Uh, so like, I don't know who started wearing all black first. It was probably me. Uh, the high collared uh, jackets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it was probably me. Uh, but it's it's hard to know, right? So um, we, we need we need those like uh, through the years shots of Christopher, like his hair gets longer, the collar gets higher. Yeah, it's, it's been, been more like Hadrian by the, seven. The big ankle boots, like the or up the knee boots, like black polished leather. <laughs> I do own a pair; they don't fit very well, so I almost <laughs> them. Um, they, they probably don't sound comfortable. <laughs> yeah, no, they um actually they're not that bad, but they don't they don't fit properly. I digress. Uh, in any case, um, I thought like wearing a costume to convention that fit with the books would be a good idea, and it was just dumb. I did it like <laughs> once, um, and decided to dress like a professional instead uh, of a clown. And so, uh, and in, in any case, it, it's hard to know exactly, but I, he's, I don't think he's a self-insert. I do think we share some personality traits in common, but I think that's a consece of, of our long association, if that makes mm. sense. Well, I hope I was a cosplay. That... I could never play a Palantine because they don't have beards. Uh, <laughs> the ones, uh, the ones on on Hadrian's homeworld don't. It's a local fashion. Oh, okay. So you're not out of the running. All right, good. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say it's interesting how someone who it, we, we don't know you that well, but just from uh, interacting with you online, seeing you online, we might think that there's uh, uh, some you in Hadrian or some Hadrian in you. Uh, I actually. I uh, wrote a pilot for a mockumentary comedy about Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So the pitch is The Office meets martial arts. And so my mum watched it and she saw me in the main character. She's like, oh, the coach, I see so much of you in him. And then my actual Brazilian jiu-jitsu coach, his wife watched it and she thought the character was based on her husband, my coach. She's like, oh, the coach is your coach, right? And then someone that heard The Office comparison said, oh, the character's based on Michael Scott. So it wasn't there's some elements yeah. of each of those but it's kind mm -hmm. of how it, you will relate it to you yourself or something else that you know you will you will connect and attach to that character yeah well the, the reality is right is, is that anything you write is you 
right? Now, it may be you in only like a tiny proportion. It may be you with negative, right? Because it may be, you know, the opposite of you. But it, it, it's all coming from, from, from you, right? And, and, and it's being processed by you. Uh, depending on how you know much of a platinist you may be uh and uh and so um and, and so there's no real getting away from it there's there's some of, of me in all of my characters right even the weird scary alien space monsters right uh because i made them up and so um which is a weird thing to think about but like there are bits of other characters personalities that i think are, are i think i'm mostly like lorian if i have to pick any of my characters at least in terms of my uh, rather gremlin a sense of humor um, and, and and things like that. Uh, he's even more dramatic than Hadrian, good lord. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and and so like so yeah, there's there's a bit of I, I think of every author and like all of their characters right now, whether that's you know their philosophy shining through or it's just some like personality quirk or whatever. Right, is a different story, but I do think that like. Uh, you know, people who know me really well, right, will be able to pick out some of those elements in any in any of the characters, or even in in like weird aesthetic choices, right? Like, um, you know, like why are there so many mosaics? I just think they're cool. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, um, yeah. you know, there's, like uh, the, there's this one line you ha have in all your books, Christopher, and I've found it in every book now. Is there's a sword of Damocles, and I I love that line. Not many people understand it. But um, I saw it in Lesser Devil. I was like, yes, I knew it would be in here. No, I didn't realize it was in all of them. It's in I all of them, yeah. Some of those things are intentional. There's a Shakespeare joke in, in each book on purpose. Uh, but, mm -hmm. uh, but that one I didn't realize was in all of them. And now I'm worried it's not in four or five. And I need to... Oh, no. <laughs> I've, caught it, I've caught it in every book so far. And I was like, oh, I wonder if it's going to be here. And then I, when I was reading Lesser Devil, I was like, yeah it's here <laughs> there's a lot of useful mythological imagery right and this also tells you something about the author right you know um mm -hmm. right is that i just happen to be conversant in a lot of this stuff right and and so uh like you know writers all get their little sort of things that they stick with um and it sort of becomes just a sort of a motif i think for a lot of people's work even if it's just like a like a weird grammatical tick right like like frank herbert will gap contractions uh like mm. he, he's or not contractions he'll gap um conjunctions mm. uh he'll do a lot of he'll like skip and and but a lot and you'll have to figure it out and he's just very attached to doing that um you know uh so it can even be like a little grammar tick but like um you know character uh, writers will have these little things uh, I like my my Greek mythological references, which is one of the reasons why this is a science fiction story and not a fantasy one, because then I couldn't use them. Um, it's yeah. funny that Dan, he's kind of like a fantasy and history expert, so he's picking up on all these references, and I'm the sci-fi guy, and I'm like, I like it when the lasers go pew pew. <laughs> I also like that part. <laughs> uh, I want to do both at once, right? Because like... Like a lot of science fiction, like you said, is really idea driven, which is, I think, like, a, I think that's Campbell's fault. Because if you go and look at the old, like, pulp adventure serials and stuff in the 20s, 30s, 40s, before, you know, Asimov and Clark really came onto the scene in, in, with, uh, with astounding and analog, right? Uh, there's a lot more high adventure in space stuff, the John Carter stuff, right? And, and um, you know, Pellucidar and, uh, and Lee Brackett's fiction and even like you know like Lovecraft and Clark Ashton Smith and and those guys and, and what was science fiction then was a lot more fantastic uh it was a lot less technical and I think that we've sort of collapsed into this sense that science fiction needs to be really technical and that stuff's great don't get me wrong big Alistair Reynolds fan um really great writer uh and um uh, but I do think uh, that there is um there's a way to do that and also tell these big sort of fantastic, you know, personal stories uh, and not lean on, on, on the tech a hundred percent. Not that Reynolds does, cause he's also got some pretty messed up characters, but some really distinct <laughs> and, and wonderful, uh, and very interesting characters. But I, I do think that there is uh, definitely a space and a hunger for science fiction stories that or in that older vein that are a little bit more high adventure with the lasers going pew pew, but also, you know, uh, sword fights and princesses and, you know, things like that.
um, which, you know, if you can get both at once, you know, is great. So. Yeah, I like a, a range of different sci-fi, whether you're plot focused, character focused, idea focused. If you do one of them excellently mm -hmm. and the others at least, you know, service the progression of the, the, that one that you focused on, that's totally fine by me. I don't mind which you focus on. And if you happen to do more than one excellently, then all the I mean, better. Happy yeah. I'm a hundred percent on board. Mm -hmm. Well, I like to like how you use like ancient history a lot and how you like, you use it kind of as like a propaganda piece in a sense for why this, like the Solon empire is the way it is. And they, it's funny how they skip over a lot of much then refer back to the ancients. And I really love that. Uh, I know it's probably because you typically enjoy ancient history as well. And um, yeah, I really love how you, you throw in these, these ancient history, um, you know, which would be 20,000 years old or 22,000 years old for some of these characters and how you reference them. And it's, I really enjoy that because I, my, my background is Clive, a degree in classical history. And uh, so uh, when I see it, I'm like giddy. <laughs> so, um, I was going to ask, because you have a lot of Latin and a lot of languages in your book uh, or books. Um, how do you, how did you approach going about creating the C. Elson language? Uh, yeah. Okay. So that's the only one that really exists. The other languages are kind of fakes. Uh, yeah. wait, I, don't, I don't need them that much. So I will, you know, if it's like two lines of dialogue book, I'm not going to go and figure out a grammar for that. Right. So I, I kind of fudge those. Um, but Sielsen itself, I, I really know to any extent, uh, three languages besides English, none of them conversational. I took uh, three years of Japanese, I took four years of Latin, uh, and, uh, I, I, and, and I've taken Spanish on and off throughout my whole life. Uh, I can really speak none of them, um, particularly my Japanese is abysmal. Uh, but, um, but I like understand how the grammar works, and even though I can't do it at speed, uh, you know, I'm like, okay, these are how declensions work in Latin for nouns, right? Mm -hmm. And so Sielsen really is like a weird, unholy mashup of Japanese and Latin grammar. And uh, and I will develop that one sentence at a time. As I'm writing the books, I'll put like an at sign at the beginning of a line of dialogue I know I want translated. And so when I'm done writing the whole manuscript, I might have 100, 200 lines of dialogue that need to be tweaked. And they're usually pretty short lines of dialogue. It's a lot of imperatives, right? Like one word imperative, like stop, you know? Uh, you know those are easy. Um, and there's some really long ones. And I always feel like a fool because when it comes time to do the audiobooks, I have 20 pages of how the hell do I say any of this shit. <laughs> and I have to then sit there with a microphone for 40 minutes pronouncing my own gibberish and I just feel like like such a thing. Uh, <laughs> the price you had to pay, Chris, for Yeah, because <laughs> I know it's all made up and I know, you know, there's some other people like, wow, this is awesome. And I'm like, I am such a dork. Uh, anyway, uh, but so no, I'll, I'll do these one sentence at a time. So if that sentence is the first time I need to figure out how I'm going to do subjunctive mood, right, then oh, I, I figure out how I'm going to do subjunctive mood. Subjunctive is hard. Subjunctive. Uh, not in Cielsen, it's very easy. There's just okay. Part. <laughs> okay. I guess for some people who don't know what the subjunctive is, the subjunctive is, it's a verb tense in Latin, where it's something that, it's it's a, to express something that ought to have happened, but never did happen. So it's saying this should have happened, but it didn't. So yeah, that's kind of how subjunctive works. Uh, we can do it easily in English, but, and, and that is one thing I will say with your Latin, because I know Latin fairly well. It's, I've been out of practice for a few years now, but when I read your Latin in the book, I'm like, he's got everything in the right place. He's got like the nominative here, like the accusative here, the verbs at the and, end. And like... Dan would have pointed out if you didn't, because there was a language, Sunny to language chat going on in Discord, and I don't speak any other languages except I did Latin in like middle school. And so I mentioned Latin. And I was like, now's my time to shine. I post like a three word joke, and Dan's like, that's grammatically incorrect. Uh, well, well, I'll do that if I need to do more because I am very rusty at this point. I think the last time I really needed it was in Hell and Dark, uh, which was a few years ago. Uh, so, but I, I used to be pretty good. I did a whole uh, I did a whole translation of Pro Archia, the Cicero uh, defense, uh, wow. for my final. Um, but I it is it is That's so impressive. so rusty. Um, I translated uh, Apuleius and the Golden Ass. It's no like, cool. It's, that's more of like a comedy, like a, a Roman comedy. Uh, really I had to do Cicero, who is, of course, a pain in the ass. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, well, 
it's funny Who with like the Earth? Latin scholars because they actually they did all their scholarly work in Greek, so which makes it even harder because then they translate the Greek to Latin. So you're going off a Greek translate a Latin translation of Greek. So it's yeah, like it's... you can boast is like I can speak Latin in Greek. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's impressive. a whole whole thing. But yeah, so uh, so that obviously th that I'm pretty careful about. But the other stuff, the like the the Nordain, the Pantai, and the Jadian are all kind of. Uh, I, I will know what I want to say, and then uh, I will look at the languages that those languages are supposed to be descended from mm -hmm. and kind of pick words and fudge the spelling around just to make it sound good, uh, which I think I have a pretty decent ear for. Uh, uh, but it, those are totally, totally fudged languages. They don't really exist. Uh, it's only CLS that has any sort of structure to it. So, which is good because it's the only one that I use in volume. So, it, it had better be convincing. Um, nice. I, I like it. I, I, I jive with it. So. Yeah, I need to organize my notes because they're a complete disaster and unreadable. I'm, to I'm, I was actually surprised you didn't have like a whole, cause, you know, some books like uh, I think Aragon's a good example where uh, Christopher Paolini created a, a language, like the ancient language. And he had a whole like language compendium in the back. I was surprised that that you didn't want to do something like that, but the the index is already pretty big at the Yeah, there was there was enough. I wanted to do, you know, timelines and like whole essays about X and Y and, and just no space. So someone's gonna walk up to your convention one day and just speak start speaking in CLS and you're like, Oh shit. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, it hasn't happened yet, but it might um, <laughs> gotta guarantee be... one day someone will start Ryman C. Elson off to you. That would be something. And then I will come back to them and say other oh, poetry is alliterative, uh, <laughs> which is like totally not true. I haven't, I just made that up now, but, <laughs> but it could be, uh, you never know. <laughs> Some, something else that I uh, really enjoy in the books is the fight scenes. Now I must mm. preface this by saying I am, I am not an Imperial soldier. I, and I am aware that I would die instantly in one of these duels, Me but too. as someone that has done Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for <laughs> over 10 years and has been around a lot of martial arts, reading the fight scenes in the Sun Eater series, they feel very visceral. They feel very real. They feel very grounded and nothing jumps out as me as, Seeming, uh, seeming unrealistic. It's like, oh, the jumping, triple spinning back heel to the face. It's like, okay, I mean, maybe in a world of like super jacked up soldier athletes, whatever, that kind of stuff is possible, but it doesn't feel real. Whereas the, the Sun Eater battles, it feels like I'm there. I feel like I'm watching a fight mm -hmm. that could really be happening. So I wanted to ask in terms of the, the style, how intentional is that? And in terms of like the, the actual technical descriptions, uh, what uh, experience or, or what have you read or done that has influenced that? Uh, so I, I recognize this is kind of a lame rap sheet, right? Uh, compared to some, like, because I, I, I've worked with writers who were like Navy SEALs, right? <laughs> or something like that. So I, uh, I, I'm very, very lame by comparison. Uh, but I, uh, I did Olympic fencing for, uh, uh, Olympic style mm -hmm. fencing, not for the Olympics, but Olympic style fencing for, uh, like seven years growing up. So a lot of sword fighting experience. And granted, that's different from like traditional, you know, historical fencing. But I did a little bit of HEMA. Um, and then I've done, I did boxing for like three or four years uh, until they locked us all in their houses. And so I've been waiting to go back to that. Um, so I have like a pretty, like, yeah, there you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, like actual, like I actually went and then, you know, got hit in the face twice a week for fun, uh, for a couple of years. Uh, and I miss it. Uh, mostly yeah. hitting other people in the face. Uh, <laughs> that part's all right. Uh, and so I've got, uh, you know, some at least practical understanding of how these things are done. And my, uh, theoretical, you know, technique is a lot better than the practical reality. Right. <laughs> and so, um, and, and of course too, with like the historical stuff, I've read some, you know, old, you know, training manuals and things like that for sword fighting and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I've got some, I've got some background there, but I, at least, I, I think that like, if you're going to write action scenes, you should at least go get hit in the head at least once. Right. <laughs> because 
<laughs> like you can kind of tell when writers like don't know like what to do with their body right because it's mm. it, it, it's very much a physical thing right you know you're you're you know hitting people right and being hit or you know shot at god forbid or whatever right and and the mechanics of how that's done like the actual body mechanics or something that you need to have an understanding of i think and it is something that i think about a lot like i will mime sequences you know i will get up from my desk and be like okay so the sword is here uh then i would naturally go you know whatever right mm -hmm. and so I'll, I'll do a lot of that as i'm writing these scenes and think about the actual spacing because i don't have a very strong like visual imagination like i can't picture things very well in my head but i can do spatial reasoning pretty pretty well right and think okay this guy's 10 feet away from me i can't see him in my brain but like he's 10 feet away from me and his arm is over there uh, which is really weird because there's no picture but like i totally know where everything is it must be how daredevil feels um <laughs> well it, and, it, it, it does feel really realistic it. though because like you know there's moments where like one of the characters get hit in the head and like they get their bell rung like really good and like you know they or they black out for a second or they're, they're stunned and uh, you know, there, there's a lot of writers where the character gets, you know, just pummeled in the face and they're like, I'm fine. But, like, you know, I even noticed that, with, like, even just reading Lester Devil, you know, like, Crispin gets his bell rung a few times and he's, he's like, stunned. And, I was uh, thinking it's I really funny appreciate. when it's like, he got shot six times in the chest but refused to go down. It's like, I'm not sure how much of a choice it is. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's... I mean, you can persevere through some things, but at some point, just, like, biology takes over. Yeah, it's less optional for sure. Uh, yeah, um, but no, that's something that like you wouldn't you wouldn't get right unless you like knew what it was like, right? Sure. And so, um, you know, a certain amount of, of practical experience is useful. By no means am I suggesting that someone who's going to write about the '80s needs to go take cocaine, uh, you know. But um, you know, within reason, like you know, there are some things. That's the title of like, this video. Yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, do, uh, do not go do that. Nobody, uh, I'm mean, not being ironic or funny. Don't go do that. Um, Stop it. But like, but like you should, if you're going to be writing a lot of sword fights, you should go like learn what those are like, right? Because they are not like Hollywood films, right? Uh, Hollywood films are meant to look good because it's a visual medium and they need the sword fighting to look good, but it's not really sword fighting. And real sword fighting could be made to look good, but it's still less flashy than, you know, what hollywood wants and so you know, like you, you need to go and you need to think about these things right and and if you're going to write about guns you should know how guns work right uh which is why i don't have them right i have you know i have you know lasers uh because i like i know a lot of writers who are really you know really expert at all things firearm right and uh i can't do that right and and there's a certain you know uh research threshold that i'm not willing to meet on 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 that particular or on, on all sorts of particular subjects right so um you know you sort of do your world building to fit your strengths right and and inevitably i get put on a a, a panel about world building at every convention i go to because that's what there there's always a world building panel and I'll, I'll i'll point this out right like i do not understand um you know modern warfare right like i don't know like what desert storm was like right or what's going on you know on the other side of the world right now i don't i don't get it right but i do i do know classical warfare right so i have no idea how to write a space battle because i you know I, i'm not an astronaut right uh and certainly not you know the sorts of people who are working in um you know uh, in in uh in, in space who are thinking of combat right and so i decided i'm going to make most of my uh space battles boarding actions and they're going to involve swords and here's why right so you work backwards from you know your strengths to find yeah. world building features that support those strengths right and so i knew i could write a good sword fight so uh how do we get there okay we'll do the shield thing right which you know dune's got shields but like everybody's got shields right so yeah. we can we can sort of work backwards from I want a sword fight to we need shields, so like missiles don't work, right? We can't do X, Y, and Z, but like we can still kind of try and wear those shields down. So like, how does that element of the combat work, right? And and so you you really just you figure out what you're good at, and you um and, and you work from there. So like I knew I could, you know, write a good scene with some sword fighting, some giant robots, and let's do that. So I think that's why I like it so much because like. That's why I like ancient histories, because 
I find guns very boring. And so like anything like modern, I'm like, I don't want that's got guns and it's kind of boring. I like swords. And one thing I, I did appreciate too, you know, switching to Crispin's point of view in Lesser Devil is his fighting style, even though he was trained by the same sword master as Hadrian, his fighting style is totally different than Hadrian's, like very more brutalistic and uh, or maybe that's just because Hadrian's dramatic. But I did appreciate that, uh, you know, even though, you know, Crispin just fights completely different than Hadrian. Yeah, yeah, that was that was super intentional, actually. That was one of the, in writing Lesser Devil, that was one of the couple things that I, like, I needed to make sure I wasn't writing Hadrian in a different suit, because I'd pretty much only written Hadrian up until that point. And so that was one of the, the dimensions that I wanted to sort of, uh, to sort of focus on uh, in, in separating them. Oh, uh, another one was was uh, was Crispin has a uh, is much more uh, let's say uh, equal opportunity uh, on the uh, on the subject of women right hatred is very much a dedicated monogamist yeah. and so uh, uh, and, and he's not interested in the you know the um, the uh, the the palace concubines and things whereas that Crispin's thing right is that and gambling and. Uh, you know, it's a very, very different set of interests. And so you like, again, you need these little like things to sort of, mm. to sort of separate characters. Cause you, if you give people just a couple little items like that, they'll really build the character around those, those cornerstones that you, that you set out. So you find these little things to help build the character and then, and then really trust your reader to do the, the, the gap filling. So. I did enjoy it. I really enjoyed that different character like Crispin and, and uh, he's a really different character from what you see in uh, Empire of Silence, which I really appreciate because I had this idea of what Crispin was in my head. And then when I read Lesser Devil, I'm like, this this is, this is character's got layers too. So I really appreciate how you, even though I'm so used to being in Hadrian's head and I love being in Hadrian's head, I, you know, just slipping into Crispin, it was like, yeah, I love, I love these Marlowe brothers. Like, yeah, I, I, liked, really... I liked how Hadrian's perspective of Crispin seem quite reasonable and Crispin's perspective of Hadrian seem quite reasonable. It's like, ah, yeah, okay. Yeah. From your shoes, I, I can see it that way too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why I really want to do, I, I want to do a lot more of these, these sort of shorter things, these uh, side character novellas. Uh, Cause it's a, it's a pretty low investment on my part in terms of time way to kind of broaden the universe and, and look at these things like, you know, with, with perspective, cause it's hard talking about the unreliable narrator to really get that on the page, right? Because you can, you can put in some outright contradictions, right? And, and readers could be like, oh, he was lying in one of these. And I don't know which one it is. Cause there's not a book to check it against. Right. Um, but I wanted to go and, and actually look at these sorts of, you know, human um fallibilities right in terms of perception and things like that so i i really want to be able to get into some more of those um those side stories as as, uh, mm -hmm. as time goes on so i'm hoping that i can get another one done maybe between book six and seven because i'm about to start book six um and i'm not 100 percent sure there's going to be seven yet and we have to see how the negotiations go i'll have to figure out how the outline is going to work but uh you know hopefully can fit one in between six and seven Sounds great. I'd love to be down for it. So to ask a, a question outside of the books, um, I know one thing that I'm super excited for, something I would love to see is Sun Eater merchandise. Is there anything that you're, you got planned or something you would love to see that you, you'd want to see a fan wearing or something like that? Yeah, so uh, we've been working on a website redesign for I don't even know how long at this point. Uh, my wife does my web development for me. Uh, cause, it, cause she's good at it and I'm not, but she also has a job, you know? And so we have been sort of, uh, lagging behind and getting that done when it launches, it's going to have at least a couple t-shirt designs. Um, I would love to be able to use the cover art for things like posters, but I do not own the rights to that yep. artwork and negotiating the rights for that with the various artists is, is difficult. And then we have to work out how payment works and things like that. And then may, it may be a little too early. Uh, given that my operation is me and my wife when she has time, right, to, to work on to work on some really ambitious stuff because uh, cause she, uh, she did put out sort of a request to see what people wanted. And they were like, oh, uh, a trading card game would be awesome. I'm like, yes, yeah, I would. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, let me get right on that. Uh, and, and it would be awesome, right? I completely agree. But, you know, we have to start a little bit smaller. 
I am going to, in the next week or so, be reaching out to map makers to get a galaxy map done because I'd said that is a Patreon goal. So we'll get that, and that I'll be able to use for maybe posters or things like game mats or something like that. But, Mm. you know, like I said, we'll start kind of small in these things, but we'll at least be getting a couple T-shirts here soon uh, when we have time to get that website finally finalized, which I know some folks have been hearing me say that it's just around the corner for months and months and months. I honestly don't know when it's going to be. It's, you know, my, my wife is like a, you know, lead data analyst for this company and it just takes some time. Uh, we'll, we'll help you get it going. The thumbnail will be merch coming soon. soon yeah. 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 Uh, buy your is, buy a high matter sword off Christopher. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. Working, uh, working sword cuts anything. Uh, yeah but no i would i would love to do more stuff uh and that is that is one way that i want to kind of kind of move things here at least with t-shirts in the immediate future but uh, i would love to be able to do more uh i have a friend who did those sort of uh, pvc statues uh you know you get from like uh like the like comic book collectibles right Mm. of a bunch of his characters like how did you do that tell me your secrets right Mm -hmm. uh because those are awesome uh and that would be really cool so uh you know we'll see but uh, it would look nice next to my medical journal yeah perfect yeah exactly uh Uh, we'll get a uh a sielson uh anatomical you know dummy and you can take (laughs) all three kidneys you know um yeah it'll be really love like a little see my daughter running around with like a stuffed sielson get that away from your child oh my gosh they're horrible uh Yeah, it's a, yeah, anyway. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, so at least t-shirts very soon. We'll have a cool. design. Yeah. Oh, I'd love that. Is there like, um, in the t-shirt design, I guess, is there, do you want like some like famous quotes on it? Like, uh, you know, like fear is a poison? Yeah, or... we, we, may do, we may do some quote stuff. I, I kind of want to do like house symbols. Yeah. Because uh, that's a relatively inexpensive bit of art to procure. So we may do like one for the Aventine House and one for Marlowe, one for the Red Company, and you know a couple of things like that. Uh, but we're gonna start small and, uh, and and roll around a couple at a time. Yeah. All right. I wonder if we should start maybe start getting into like some spoilers because a lot of the questions that the uh, our subscribers gave us like do have spoilers, like spoiler related questions. So unless Jonathan, do you have any questions you want to ask as non spoiler related? non-spoiler related okay well okay i had i had a couple of theories that i wanted to throw at you uh this this theory is for and that sounds spoilery it's for the book covers okay so christopher you are a north carolina guy right yeah and do you like do you like sports at all do you happen to like basketball uh, I'm not a huge basketball guy, but you know, being in North Carolina, you know, one can't really get away from it. Right, and my wife cut out, really... It kind of cut out for a second. I think Christopher said he likes basketball, so he's from North Carolina. He likes <laughs> basketball. What is the best <laughs> NBA logo of all time? Of course, the original Charlotte Hornets logo. Wait, Charlotte, North Carolina. All right, things are starting to come together. What color is the Charlotte Hornets logo? Purple and teal. Empire of Science, the first book in this series. What color is that cover? It is purple. Christopher, I propose to you the final book in the series will be Charlotte Hornets Teal. Uh, it could be. Who knows? Uh, I'll never tell. Feeling good about it. Oh, yeah. You went really far down the rabbit hole on that one. That was, uh, <laughs> that was pretty advanced. Uh, <laughs> tell tell but, me I'm wrong. Uh, I don't actually know uh, what the colors are going to be for, for the last two books. I, I know who I want on the covers. But I don't know. Uh, uh, well, I have a few options for, for for six. I know seven is easy, but um, but I don't know what color it's going to be. So, but it'll totally be teal. You're correct. Not... <laughs> um, yeah, okay, anyway. everyone, remember that. We'll put that in yes. the title now. The book My... seven will be teal. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you nailed it. So. You'll never believe the reason why. Um, oh, my, my other, my other. This is somewhat of a theory. Uh, so something that's kind of something that I've noticed of people on my channel that have commented, oh, I saw this or you recommended that I went and bought it. The number one book that I have convinced people to buy is Empire of Silence. 
And is that because of my enthusiasm for the for the series? Perhaps. Is it because it just sounds good? It's got a great premise. Probably. Is it because it has an awesome cover? And is it because lots of other people, not just me, are raving about it? These are all possibilities. But I propose, based on the fact that the second most common book that people tell me that they have bought being a memory called Empire, is the word Empire. So I, my suggestion to you, book seven, I don't know if you have a book seven title, Empire of Empires, The Emperor's Empire, uh, The Empire to End All Empires. I, I think there's a lot of money in, in Christopher. I don't know I don't know if you need help with book titles, but I, I feel like I'm giving you gold here. Yeah, I, I think you may be onto something. Uh, when I worked at Bain Books, we, we used to laugh uh, about the, uh, the Bain Books title word pool, right? Because it was always freedom and shadow and victory and call <laughs> and, you know, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so there the are all to victory is a shadow yes you know, yes the shadow of freedom that. call to victory yes uh mm -hmm. and so you get these sort of like uh you know, clusters of keywords and i think empire absolutely is like a ten dollar book title word uh <laughs> you know like if you can get that into your into your title uh, by all accounts uh, do you know um, that's right up there with the words Harry and Potter, like just <laughs> with the words Empire, and Harry. Yeah. Well, Harry Potter's Empire. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, also, anything involving like you know, uh, like like fire. Usually, you know, you could put that in a fantasy. Well, that's title. why probably like the book cover five, uh, Ashes of Man. Everyone was raving about it because there's a ton of fire everywhere. Yeah, it, it helps. Uh, it helps. Fire, I'm really fire, glad everyone was so excited yeah. about that. I, I had to uh, had to work to keep that title because uh, some some other forces wanted to to change it. So I'm glad that it's stuck and everyone's been so happy. So. I guess I was going to ask that too. Like, how do you do? You have the titles for the books set in your mind before you, um, or is that something you're you're nebulous on when you're writing? I the book? I at least need a title to start because I find that until I name something, it doesn't exist, which mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, a, a principle of, of ancient magic. Right. Uh, and so, uh, That's very true. It's a name. Yeah. Name's very important. Yeah. And so, uh, I, once I title something, it, it, it exists, even if it's only a working title. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so occasionally I'll spit out like a, a working title, right. And, and it'll, a better title will present itself and I'll change it. Um, but very often titles have stuck. Uh, but I, I, I found I was struggled for ages to title Demon in White. I didn't know what to call it. Uh, and uh, I couldn't even start thinking about the book until I had something to call it. So it was, Maybe uh, that's something we can like bridge into the spoiler section is what were some titles you potentially had for Demon in White? And then when you settled on Demon in White. So maybe we'll say here, guys, we're going to shift into the spoiler section. So this is going to be spoilers for all the published stuff. So uh, you know, Emperor of Silence, Howling Dark, Lesser Devil, uh, Demon in White. We're not going to be touching Kingdoms of Death. So uh, if you want to stick around for the spoiler section, you know, please do. And so Christopher, we'll let you take over from where we last left off there. Yeah, so I don't remember that I had any working titles exactly. I just like had a big hole, right, where I needed a title. I needed a book, right, because it didn't have a title, so it didn't exist. And the uh, so I can tell you at least how I got there, which which mm. may be uh, as interesting and totally random. And look at how my brain is uh, wired. May be too generous a term, but. <laughs> Uh, there is a, an obscure Black Sabbath title uh, song called uh, Heaven in Black, which is about the building of St. Basil's. Uh, and I can't remember the name of the architect, but he was blinded uh, after it was done. And it's about, it's about, it's a really good song. And uh, it's from the Tony Martin era, which is uh, an era of Black Sabbath history almost nobody knows about because they kind of assume it's only Ozzy Osbourne's band. And it was never Ozzy Osbourne's band. Uh, it was Tony Iommi's band, uh, and uh, Ozzy Osbourne just sang for it, and um, <laughs> and he's good. He's good. Don't get me wrong. I'm mm -hmm. being I'm being a bit mean. Uh, I like Ozzy's uh, Ozzy's albums, Black Sabbath, but I like Dio's and I like Tony Martin's better. Uh, and it's it's um, it's from um, it's from Tear, 
uh, or tier, depending on how you want to say it. Uh, but it's a really good song, and it's about the building of St. Babel, and I like the I like the X in Y construction, right? Just the the, the, of the title, Heaven in Black, right? You know, we've got Rhapsody in Blue, right, or whatever. And so I was like, what can I do with that instead of, uh, you know, X of Y or, you know, we had an adjective in, uh, in, in uh, book two. And so I thought I would, I would go this way and I just picked the opposite color. It was like, okay, where are we going here? And then uh, I thought about, I thought about the Cielsen who are, you know, demons, right? And so I thought, hey, I'll just flip the, you know, grammatical structure of the song title, uh, you know, uh, change the color and it'll be about the Cielsen, right? And then when we came, when it came time to do the cover, I had wanted to put Hadrian and Valka together uh, on the cover and do sort of the classic, you know, uh, sword and planet like thing where he's going like this. Mm -hmm and has the sword out and they were like it's gonna look like a romance book and i was like it slightly is uh, <laughs> yeah. and they were like, uh no we're not doing that um and uh so i gave them a couple other suggestions so they usually end up giving two or three cover ideas and they wanted the emperor and so we did the emperor for the cover which is cool it's a really awesome painting kieran yanner is the man mm -hmm. and uh the unintended side effect of this point <laughs> was that it really helped obscure what the title was about because uh, the emperors wear white and so yeah. people were like who is the demon in white right and yeah and it could easily refer to all sorts of things For um sure. there's a comical like diegetic answer to the question it's actually hadrian um that is one of his many titles but people um you know people were like oh what's going on like do we need to you know it really set up the evil emperor expectation in in readers and that was a nice way to mess with you all right that was totally unintentional <laughs> consequence of this very weird uh totally non-linear crazy bit of, of creative processing that i've just tried to explain uh that and, happened and to me when because when i read howling dark demon and white had already come out and i think at the at the end of howling dark the emperor is referenced as wearing white and I was like, oh, man, here it goes. Yeah. Set up a book three. There's a demon in white. And then in demon oh, in white, you... Adrian gets referred to the demon in white. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, this layers. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was like, I actually took a deep breath. I was like, oh, thank God it's Hadrian and not like some other like monstrosity that's gonna, that we should be really worried about. I mean, Hadrian <laughs> is scary. But I mean, um, I actually breathed a sigh of like relief like, Okay, it's only Hadrian, but he's the demon of white. <laughs> Don't worry, the, the monstrosities are coming. Okay. Oh no. I will say the the um actually one thing, one of the funny things I was gonna say, going back a little bit to the Empire of Silence cover or the you know, one of my people I talked to on Discord, I'm like, well, why did you buy? He's like, it's purple. <laughs> like that was one, hey, it's one of the, know, it's one of the two uh, best colors. Books, it's it's definitely up there uh yeah and and and, and i wanted character driven covers right like my suggestion was always to put a person on it right because science fiction mm. always had to favor you know um you know uh just 3d rendered spaceships right and those are cool but they're also pretty immemorable and yeah, you can't relate to a spaceship you can't right and so i want to do the character thing i wanted you know uh, an actual painting right as opposed to photo manipulation or something like that and, and mm -hmm. i think the result has been uh a book series is pretty visually distinctive and uh even if people haven't read it yet which is most people uh you know uh they are at least aware of it because they saw it next to some other less memorable book covers and i think i think that's been it does pop they really and, pop off the shelf i i i heard about the series x amount of time before i actually read it and I was like, okay, this sounds pretty cool. I'm going to put it on on my TBR. And then I think it was the purple. Honestly, I just think about it. Like every time I'd update my TBR, I'd be like, man, Empire of Silence is like too far down. It. Like, let me bump it up a little bit. And then I'm like, ah, oh, man, this this story. I mean, I think it was like hearing good reviews and, and the story sounding mm -hmm. cool. But that was kind of connected visually to that little, little purple thumbnail that i'd seen on my screen and it, i just kept on bumping it up into my tbr until i was like you know what screw, i'm just screw the schedule screw the spreadsheet i'm going rogue 
yeah, Reading well, Empire of Silence. <laughs> you never know what factor is going to be the thing that sells a book to somebody, right? It may be the cover. It may be the title. It may be something they've heard about it. It may be that it was in the right part of the bookstore on the five-minute window they walked in, right? And and so I think I think it's cool. I think I've been really lucky uh, with the with the cover art, working with Sam and working with Kieran. Uh, I'm working with the other artists too, although I, I've not been as directly involved with like the overseas stuff. Uh, I will say, uh, Christopher, I'm taking one for the team for you this month because uh, my wife and I do like a quarterly book swap where she's big into like historical romance and like sci and fantasy romance. So she'll make me read a romance book. So I'm reading a romance book this month for her and I'm making her read Empire of Silence. Oh, well, so, you'll get your revenge when she gets to Demon in White then and it's slightly a romance novel. Uh, yeah. Oh, it was so good though. Oh, it was so slightly. good. Well, thank it's slightly, you. but it's it's really well done. Like uh, like the the romance between Valka and like Hadrian, and um, I'm I'm always worried about their relationship because I love their relationship so much. But then you know, reading Demon and White, you know, they've had a a lifetime together, more than um, you know, than any human would have together in a relationship. So, you know the way the way the story's going and how old hadrian is you kind of think like this relationship may not last the entire series but they have had a life together longer than most characters and anyone would ever experience so i don't feel as bad but it's it's such a great relationship and their relationship that they have um how did you go about building that type of relationship and, and approaching writing that uh combatively uh, they don't agree on, on like any sort of fundamental, uh, principles really, uh, except, you know, some like pretty abstract stuff, like, you know, you know, uh, goodness and decency, but they, they argue incessantly, like even, even now I knew I didn't want to do the, like the, like long suffering sort of like, will they, won't they thing. Um, there's, a, there's obviously, you know, maybe about a book's worth of that because it's pretty late in book one that they made and it's... There's a, yeah, there's a little bit in um, Empire of Silence where Hadrian had a little bit of like, uh, like, excuse my, like a little bit of blue balls in a sense where I was like, oh, will they or then... Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, he's, he's young, right? He's a lot younger than her in the first book. Right? Yeah. And that's another thing too, because that stops being the case because of time travel, uh, not time travel, but space travel and uh people being frozen and things like that so there are a lot of like weird little dynamics that are baked in there right and they're, they're different cultures too i knew i wanted her to be from a very different place because i wanted her to criticize his worldview constantly mm -hmm. uh not because i think his worldview is necessarily wrong i think it's it would be stupid of me as as uh the writer to say who i think is right or wrong about x or y uh but because having them argue about things is going to be more interesting Right. So she comes from this very critical place of him, of his culture, his people, his society, uh, his worldview, his beliefs and his actions. Right. And he feels the same way about hers. And I think that they love each other despite that stuff. Um, and I also think that in talking about like perceptions, I think that Hadrian is a lot harder on himself than he probably deserves. And I think that For she, sure is. I don't, yeah. she sees that, right? And because I tried to write her novella, uh, which is outlined uh, and failed because it's not outlined enough. And uh, and, it, and a big a big gap there is that I didn't quite understand her perspective on him as well as the reverse because I've been in his head so much, right? Um, but obviously, you know, there's some elements there too of like personal experience in terms of, um, you know, my marriage and in terms of, which is not a very long marriage. I've only been married, uh, you know, two years now, but in terms of, Congrats. um, oh, thank you. Congrats, yeah. Uh, I, think I think we're all actually married. I, I got married in 2017. So four and a bit years. I got oh, married in 2015. So married, a, married a bit now. Yeah. Great uh so there's a little bit of a little bit of that goes into it right and a little bit of you know like failed relationships right and uh because there's there's some of that too with with Jinan, right or or uh or cat right and, and um yeah. those are very different relationships but sure. you you know you you do draw from personal experience to a certain extent and and you draw from you know uh the experiences you didn't have right that you you know choices you wish you'd made or wish you didn't make and 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 things like that or or the people you know have made right um and, and all that can kind of go into it but really i knew that i wanted valka and hadrian to be opponents right and to mm -hmm. enjoy that about one another um because she 
I think wins every argument, at least rhetorically, <laughs> that they have. Uh, whether or not she's actually right is a different, a different conversation. Well, and it's broadly, because I find that it's very difficult to argue with with someone that you're in a relationship with. For right? sure. I, I don't think that it's it's easy, and I think it's easier for Hadrian to 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 not really, you know, go all out in these debates, but to like let her. Uh, to let her to let her win sometimes, but also like he doesn't necessarily have the 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 barb to hand to to get the upper hand in these arguments. Yeah. Um, and uh, and she also will frequently frustrate his expectations, right? Especially in book three, how he thinks she's going to respond to certain things. She's like, yeah. no, I'm from the other side of space, and <laughs> and that really like he's like, no, I wanted to have the argument, and we're not having the argument, right? Yeah. So that's totally. I love that. Right? I love that. I loved her. Uh, how logical she is. Uh, <laughs> Valk is one of those characters she reminds me, he's like, I may not always be right, but I'm never wrong. And, yeah, that's uh, exactly her thing, right? And, and of like, course, though, right, like, she is sometimes, right? Yeah. And and he won't tell her that because that's, you know, that's their relationship. But it, it, I, I actually, I, I like to joke that that I they're sort of the romantic version of of Ivan and Alyosha from uh, from Brothers Karamazov, right? Because Ivan wins every single argument they ever had because he's the smart one, right? Uh, and but by the end of the book, it's Alyosha is correct, right? In in terms of the actual arguments they've been having about you know God and how to live and things like that, and so that kind of dynamic where Hadrian is maybe correct about things but loses these arguments with her was sort of an inspiration in, uh, in in building that relationship because things don't need to be resolved and they don't need to be, you know, wrapped up neatly. And so having, you know, these arguments of theirs not work out uh, in, in a way that gives them clean answers, right, or, or makes them happy is life, right? Yeah. Uh, and, so, and so that was really a focus. But they, there seem like a couple that they don't go to bed angry at each other, though, in a sense, though they, they do yeah, try and work that... They work through it. And one thing I do really want to give um, props to, like, you know, transitioning from Empire of Silence into um, Howling Dark was I really appreciated that you gave Hadrian another romantic relationship with Jinan that, you know, he wasn't just this lovesick puppy pining after Volca and that um, it really, like, established Hadrian is like, uh, you know, he had some self-realization and he's like, okay, this is not a relationship I can pursue at this time. And then of him having that relationship with Jinan, I really enjoyed. Um, I know that was probably intentional on your part, but I really oh. enjoyed that you did that. And it, it really made Hadrian seem like a really well-rounded character and had some, a lot of self-realization. Yeah, well, this is maybe a really terrible way to talk about even fake people, right? But to an extent, uh, in, in outlining the whole series, right, both Genon and, and Kat existed to kind of get some first relationship awkwardness out of the way so that that mm. wasn't his relationship with Nalka. Uh, and so uh, he, he, those characters, one of the functions that they serve was to get a lot of that done. Uh, you know, which is not by any means their only their only their only purpose. But mm -hmm. to, I, I did want with Hadrian and Dalka to have this, but like long, e effectively a marriage, right? And I wanted to depict that instead of usually these novels are looking at the early stages, right? They're looking at at, at early romance, and the book me and stories usually end in traditional comedic fashion with a wedding, right? Like that happens. <laughs> Well, it's like any romance novel, like you know they're gonna get together in the end, right? So that's I, I did like that you you kind of flipped it on its head at the beginning of Howling Dark, where it, it subverted my expectations, which I yeah, the will be one thing is is less interesting, uh, I think, than the how, right? Mm -hmm. And and I wanted to look at, uh, I wanted to look at that. I wanted to look at the actual relationship instead of uh, the courtship because it's that that's only a tiny part of anyone's life, right? For sure. Something, something that I noticed in the disagreements between Valka and Hadrian is that often I will see both perspectives. Like even if I agree with one more than the other, both are making reasonable arguments from their side. The one time where I was like, I was like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm throwing all my eggs in, in the one basket was when, I might be getting the name wrong, when Hadrian has the, his first kind of quiet, experience in Kalaga, is that the right? Uh, yeah, Kalaga, yeah. Kalaga. And he tells 
like he's been gone for however long, comes back and tells Valka and she doesn't believe him. And I think, and, and I'll, you can clarify this, it's due to the cultural differences of the Tavrosi. They're very like analytical. They don't have as much belief in the fantastical. But when it like, it's such a crazy story. It's like for him to say that, like he's af he's either being like, really mean just being totally obnoxious like making something up or he's like a lunatic and and she doesn't buy it at least not at first and i was like oh no this is uh, that, that stressed me out yeah it stressed me out too uh <laughs> because i knew i knew what was going on right and and, 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 yeah, and, and it is for that reason right it, she is from this very materialist you know rational scientific place and, uh, you know, the word rational in, in, in that sense needs to be used very advisedly because, um, you know, there are, there are things that are beyond the, her experience, right? And, and so just to discount that because it doesn't feel the experience isn't actually rational. Uh, I think that makes more sense, though. Like, when you kind of address it a little bit in Demon in White where, you know, when they discover, like, where Hadrian discovers what the quiet is and what their purpose is, that, and, and, like, even just that the language she thought was a language isn't a language, it's really, like, uh, technology, um, you know, how, like, it shattered her kind of view of, like, she thought she'd be the one to discover it, she thought this and this and this, and I, I don't know if it was out of place for Valka because of uh, that, that disagreement, because she's one of those people, like, she has to touch and feel it, and, work it out in her mind so i i was right with her on that like if yeah I, it's, it's an incredible series of claims I, I mean you know uh the the world is a lot bigger in in the sun eater universe the galaxy is a lot bigger than anybody really thinks it is right um and there's a lot going on in terms of other civilizations and cultures that even the people who think they know don't know right uh and it's and it's been going on for a long time and it is weirder and uh more supernatural isn't quite the right word because i don't really believe that there's such a thing as, as supernatural i think the things we call supernatural are just things that we don't understand uh I, i'm i'm quite open to considering these things as a religious person but i do think that they are part of of nature i just think that nature is bigger and the the universe reflects that right um uh some things right uh it, it's sort of the reverse of clark's law right it's as clark will say that uh, you know sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from, from magic but magic and sufficiently advanced technology may also you know be the same thing right you know like mm. just you know it what people have been dismissing, you know, or what Valka dismisses as magic or nonsense, right, may just be more complicated and deeper than she knows, right? And, and so I, I can't fault her either for her reactions, but... Which is funny, because, like, she gets called a witch all the time, too, right? Because some of the stuff <laughs> that she can do is that she's it's almost exactly... seen as a magical being, right? <laughs> right, but that's also why she's so sensitive about it, right? Mm -hmm. Because... She knows full well that it's not really magic. Uh, she's doing computer science with some implants in her brain, right? Uh, now that has some pretty spooky effects, right? But, uh, you know, she knows that it's not actually magic. But this is the sort of thing I'm talking about, right? Like, you know, it, it looks like magic if you don't know what's going on. And so when you, you've got this guy coming out saying, oh, there's a whole secret room. Uh, the, the ceiling is too high. I don't know what's going on. Uh, she's like, that. Uh, like uh, you peasants are at it again, man. Yeah, uh, you barbarians. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is actually a good segue for a question from one of the one of our Discord members. So, uh, this is from Kristen. Um, it's a uh, if if you could go back and change one thing from a previous book, no matter how small, what would it be? Oh man, um, I think I would go back and I would just do a general prose cleanup on book one because I think I could do a lot. I think I could hit a lot of the notes I was hitting harder now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of like if you listen to a musician do uh, a, a new recording of the song from their first album and they like do the solo differently or something like that. And you're like, oh, yeah, they're a much better guitar player these days, right? I, I think that I could do that better. As far as like an actual character beat, I don't know. Um, I don't know that I would change anything that happens uh, in, a, in, in like a substantive way. I, I, I like the choices that I've made, but I think that just the general quality of the work, particularly on first 
on, on book one, I could maybe do a little bit better. Book one's underrated. You don't need, you don't need to change anything, Chris. Yeah, <laughs> people always come out with these like remixes and stuff, and it's like, yeah, it's technically better, but I like the way it was. It was yeah, good. I, I, I get Leave that too. Alone. I get that too, but I uh, I like the Dio version of Paranoid better than the Aussie version. So, you know, there's a case to be made here. And this also actually, you know, kind of could fit in with what we're talking about, right? Because if they were to package a, a, a an updated version of book one as a new translation and uh, introduce some discrepancies, uh, then it would get really interesting, right? There's like a, like a cool way to do this. I also mm. don't know that I'm ever going to have the time to do something like that. That's a really like a really advanced, you know, big brain sort of thing to do. Uh, but uh, but I, I do think there are some, some places that I might polish, right? And that's true even in the more recent books, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll reread something like Christopher. If you'd said above instead of, uh, you know, on top of, the Senate would be better. Um, do, you, do you think in some ways um, you're... So how old were you when Empire of Silence, or you wrote Empire of Silence? When I wrote it, I was 21. So, so do you think in some ways, obviously you knew the structure of your own series, the stories that you, the story that you wanted to tell, Hadrian would obviously age uh, as the series went on. But you, starting relatively young, do you think in some ways that that has helped you, perhaps like your age, your maturity as a writer is reflected in the series as Hadrian ages? Yeah, oh, big time. Uh, I, and most significantly in book one, is I underwent some pretty uh, pretty serious growing up between writing the first draft and the revision. Um, the the to give a concrete example, uh, and, and I recognize this may weird some people out because some people are not comfortable with 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 talking about religion in 2022. But uh, I returned to the church. I had been agnostic, and I, I returned to being a Catholic in the process of revising book one. And when I wrote the book originally, the chantry was just a cheap stereotype of, of religion and i became very uncomfortable with that in revision and i ended up making it a bit more complicated um it still is but hadrian has very complex attitudes towards like you know other religions right it's not really big on the chantry which you can tell is obviously a political farce right but he is obviously a bit more skeptical of um you know that attitude in general it's sort of one of the things that he and Val could fight about uh, and so I ended up getting uh, a lot of distance between Hadrian the character and Hadrian the narrator because of those the, those life changes. And I think that was to the benefit of the writing. Uh, I think the end product is a lot more interesting uh, and distinctive than it would have been if I hadn't grown up at exactly the right time. Um, and so that's, that's a very concrete example. But two, right, like as things have gone on, like I got married in the process of this, right? And so I always knew I wanted to write their relationship mostly as as, as it's sort of a de facto marriage, right? They're not formally married, but mm -hmm. for legal reasons. Um, but I knew I wanted to write it that way. But I think I could do it better now than I could have 10 years ago, um, you know? And so I think things like that have been helpful. Um, and uh and so yeah i think I, I think totally totally uh getting older to the extent that i've gotten older uh has been has been helpful yeah. you're not not quite keeping up with hadrian but yeah well, maybe not <laughs> uh not yet but I, I do like how hadrian does feel older in every subsequent book where he his mentality like he he has this like uh, this this mental growth, and you can feel it without you having to really change Hadrian too much. And I really appreciate that. And how do you go about trying to write someone who is like 200, 300 years old? I basically treat him, and I treat everybody as kind of a new character every time I start the next book because there's been so mm. much time. And um, and so I just take into account like you know the parts that are the same are the same right but I will make some pretty intentional choices talking about hitting those notes right uh, in how I want the character to be different now that it's been two hundred years right mm -hmm. and th the reality is I think that people are actually pretty static once they once they grow up like there are some some changes that get made but you know my father will tell me that he still feels like he's twenty five right like in his head right. And, you know, he's, he's pushing 60, right? So there are some obviously, you know, like he's not 25, right? But like he still feels the same. I think broadly that principle is going to hold true, uh, you know, when you're 300 as you were at 30, right? If that's even possible, which it probably biologically isn't. 
Um, I don't know that we can actually stretch our telomeres like this. Uh, but um, but I kind of thought the general principle would hold, right? There's just more of everything. There's more loss. There's more, you know, uh, good moments and all of that. Yeah. But I do think that he, he basically feels like an adult and has felt like an adult the whole time. But, you know, some more things have happened. So it's really just about reacting to those new events. I guess this kind of ties into one of my favorite characters in the entire series is Karn Sagara. I mm -hmm. absolutely love Karn. He's probably one of my favorite characters. It's and Howling Dark. The cover art for Howling Dark is my favorite cover art that uh, of this of the series. How did you write this character? So one of the things when I was I I I just sit there and hallucinate while I'm reading. And when you first meet Karn, like this was, I'm I'm just keep saying to my mind like. This needs to be made into a movie or a show because you wrote it so cinematically that it was it was so well done. And it's just how do you approach writing a character that's fifteen thousand years old? Uh, I just assume he knows everything, everything. Uh, yeah. at least actually, for starters, uh, and and he kind of wants everyone to know it. But the big thing about Karn mm. is that he, time is very meaningless to him at this point, mm. right? Because um, he also, not not so much because he's so old, but because he has no expectation that he's going to die. Yeah. Uh, and because, one, he actually, he's been dead for a very long time. Uh, you know, I, I'm of the opinion that actual Karn is dead and this is some weird, horrible monster. Uh, but, uh, but he, you know, he knows that like, oh, if I get shot in the head, like there will be another one, right? And they will have all of my memories and our continuity will be short. And so he's not in a hurry. Uh, nothing is pressing. Everything is mm -hmm. trivial. Um, and, uh, and, and nothing really means anything to him which is one response to that much experience. I think the other is to go in the opposite direction. Uh, but he has become pretty, you know, uh, nihilistic and materialistic. And that's why he's so interested in aesthetics too, right? Is because it's kind of the only new thing that's left for him. Yeah. Because uh, he, he's heard all of the arguments for things and he's decided what, he's, what he thinks is right. And his mind is made up. He's not open to persuasion at all. Uh, yeah, well, he's but, a collector too. I love that, that he had this collection of art and like the first thing he says to hate or one of the first things he says to hadrian is about his sword that the the high matter sword that hadrian had and how he would he tried to buy it off him right and <laughs> like uh i really I, I don't know this this character was so cool and i i like how you really reference like the ship of theseus with karn right um oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah i love that uh and for those who don't know the ship of theseus is uh it's like a philosophical construct where um the, sh the sh theseus had the ship in it aged and they would do uh, and then they would uh, replace the boards and they would replace the mass and replace the sails and eventually it's a completely different ship by the time everything's been replaced so is it the same ship even though it looks the same but all the boards have been replaced in a sense so i just love that character uh, yeah the favorite. other thing that's worth noting too is the the new incarnations at the end of the book do not behave the same way mm. uh if you if you look, they have very slight personality differences, and Hadrian is kind of sensitive to them. And that's because if you just copy your you know your thoughts into another brain, you're looking at a different you're looking at a different body, right? You're looking at a different endocrine system, right? Mm. Uh, different hormone you know balances and things like that. And so there are different behaviors that sort of manifest. There's is not the same person incarnation incarnation either, right? And so what he what sort of constant between him or sort of his more rational you know like logical detached thoughts but he's been experimenting with different bodies as another form of novelty uh, over time and he is he's one of my he's one of my favorite characters i definitely want to you know go back and deal with that part of the universe at some point because that, that was going to ask one of those questions oh sorry jonathan you go ahead i was just going to say uh, it was interesting talking uh, about the perception of time so for example like it made me think of a little kid that's getting impatient having to wait three minutes for the muffins to bake and then me i'm 30 and i'm getting impatient waiting three weeks for kingdoms of death to be released cancer guy is fifteen thousand years old or whatever he is he's like if it's going to take me three years to answer this question you will wait yeah uh, and yeah. that was sort of the that was the the thing I started with with that character was that he was just going to make everybody wait because <laughs> he's not in a hurry. And also his customers are all dying, right? So there's like an element of of, of, <laughs> cruel, of cruel amusement 
you know, I eat. like that when they all they're they're all in this room and they start to smell and all their clothes are like soaked through with sweat and like they're just grungy these Palantines. I like that. It's like, you know, he just doesn't care and he puts you in your place. And uh, one I would love a Karn a Karn cigar a short or even a, a story because that was one of, one of the questions we asked. Like, are we were asked by people on Discord is is there would you love to explore like writing a Karn story? And the biggest one was would you ever write a Simeon the Red? Uh, we're hoping for a Simeon the Red trilogy. Uh, I don't know about <laughs> trilogy, but, uh, but yeah, I want to do a Simeon story for sure. The, the obstacle there is I have to do another alien language. Uh, and mm. uh, so it won't be next. Uh, as for Karn, yes, I don't know that it'll be the origin story. I don't think that's mm. the most interesting story I could do with him anyway. Uh, no. I know some people have been like, Can we do his like origin story. Like Fighting Pirates is cool, but he's not Karn yet. So like, yeah. like what would the point be? Um, but yeah, no, totally. Uh, in both of those cases, I would like to do that at some point. We'll get into a question here that um, everyone's really been asking is, um, what was your inspiration for Tor Gibson? Oh, that's a, that is a good question. Uh, I don't know that it's any one person. So uh, if you've read Demon in White, you know who he's named after. Uh, he's Because the Scolius will take the names of uh, previous academics because they are not supposed to be contributing to the cause of, of science or arts and letters for their own sake. They're not out. So they, they take old scholar names because it's not about them. Uh, and uh, in the same way that like you take a confirmation name, right? Yeah. Something like that. And so he's named after uh, my friend, uh, uh, Christopher Marcus Gibson, who is a uh, classical philosophy uh, lecturer at Princeton. Uh, I grew up with him. Uh, and uh, we've been friends since fourth grade. I was in fourth grade. And uh, and so he helps me a lot with uh, more obscure philosophical references. If I've got like an idea, I'm like, wouldn't it be cool, like science fictionally, if X or Y? And he's like, oh, there's actually this old philosopher who has a similar idea and you could sort of fit that in, right? So he will he will help me with, with stuff like that. But as far as the actual relationship uh, between Hadrian and Gibson, no, uh, it's not so much, you know, they're, they're not, you know, equals growing up in grade school or anything like that. So it's not, he's not really the uh, the inspiration there. Uh, there are probably, you know, bits of my grandfather, right, uh, in there. There are probably bits of certain school teachers that I've had. Um, but I knew that I wanted Hadrian to have this older mentor. Uh, and uh, it's a little bit of a stock character starting out, right? Like, you know, there just is the older mentor character. And so you draw from a lot of different places in building mm -hmm. someone like that. Um, but uh, I, it's hard for me to point at any particular individual person and say that's where the idea came from, which is usually the case with my characters right there. Mm -hmm. I can't think of, with a very few exceptions, where I can say, oh, this person is inspired by x right it's usually by x and y and z and a and b and also some of this and uh star wars and you know whatever right um so that was it's hard to say for sure but uh but my friend but marcus is uh there's a lot of marcus there uh in terms of the you know the information and stuff um so yeah we that love Gibson. We stand for Gibson. Yeah. Well, that, that character puts in work, you know, like for someone who's only there briefly in Empire of Silence and then how much he brings to the story. And we you, you reference it a lot that the quiet is kind of the is the Gibson in Hadrian's mind, but um how how foundational he really was in like the formation of Hadrian. Um and you know, then when he pops Sometimes up you in have Demon a, you have a teacher that's like well tell someone something and then three movies later or six books later they're like ah i did it because of this guy or this lady and you're like hey you're giving them too much credit whereas like yeah. in Sudator, i like i feel the impact of gibson i connected yeah, to yeah. gibson when he was there and that like that feeling stayed throughout the period that we were yeah so, so sadly separated from him yeah well he i, I wanted him to be a presence right because there's no reason that characters who are dead or otherwise off stage need to not be in the book ever, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, with this sense that they that p people go away when they die, and and even if you don't believe in you know another life, that's not true, right? <laughs> like you know, like if you're your my, my grandparents are no longer with me, but I think about them all the time, yeah. right? 
you know, like they, they still impact you. And so just because the character isn't around doesn't mean they can't be present. There's, um, there's an anime I really like, uh, called, uh, Psycho Pets, uh, and it's a cyberpunk sort of crime thriller thing. Really great villain in the first season. One of the best villains in anything I've ever seen. Um, and uh, for one reason or another, is not around anymore. But the one of the main characters continues to imagine that he is there, and they have these sort of uh, philosophical, like you know, bits of repartee back and forth. And it's unclear if he's hallucinating or or like is like really losing it or if it's an actual ghost or like what's going on because the show never commits to like giving you an answer it doesn't need to right it's mm -hmm. just it's used to have those two characters talk and we have this sense in modern storytelling that like we need to just depict what's actually physically happening right like there's no formalism there's no surrealism there's no you know, abstraction at all. It's just the real events are on screen or on the page, right? And no, right? Because that's not what real life is like anyway, right? Like mm -hmm. you may not be hallucinating your old, you know, mentor or your grandfather or something, but they are usually pretty present for people, right? You know, they're having these old thoughts about, you know, their parents who are no longer around or their sibling who passed away when they were young or who lives on the other side of the world or whatever. And so with Gibson, I knew he's only going to actually be there for a little bit, but there's no reason to get rid of him. Um, and of course, you know, as you mentioned, there's a complicating factor of when is it not him, right? Yeah. Because, uh, because of course, Hadrian is having these visions that are in dreams that are not visions or dreams but are actually happening so mm. so we talked about you know not doing the things you know, you know uh only depicting what's actually happening but sometimes sometimes it's actually happening right so was the intention always to bring tor back in demon and white or was yes. that something okay because that was like when that happened i was like okay like you're hitting me on an emotional level I wasn't ready for <laughs> when I read it. Yeah. And then you you know he's going to be leaving tour again, and you're like, you're, you're doing this to me twice, Christopher? You're killing me. Like, yeah, so I I won't say which book uh, this was a response to, but there's another book series that I was reading, and I read a post on, I think of all places, Reddit, which I do not really like. It is one of my least favorite websites. Uh <laughs> Uh, meaning no disrespect to any Redditors uh, watching. It just doesn't work for me. And they said, I don't care about any of these other characters, this main character is wandering around with. All I want is for him to go back and talk to the old guy from the first book and, and show him how he's doing. <laughs> and I was like, you're right. That is actually all I care about in this series. And uh, I don't know why we're dealing with any of this other stuff either. So I'm just going to steal that from this uh, post here, complaining about this other book and actually do that. And this was like seven years ago that I read this thing and I thought about it like, they're right. This is exactly what people want, you know? And and you do, as a writer, want to give the people what they want. You want to hopefully give them something they didn't know they wanted. Um, but you don't want to like go and like punch them in the nose like certain uh, Star Wars film directors uh, have said they wanted to do, right? Yeah. Like, you're not trying, like, I'm not trying to hurt anybody by telling no. the story that bad things are going to happen, right? Uh, you know, and I do want to like surprise you and pull the rug out from under your feet, but hopefully what's under the rug is like a thing you never knew you wanted, right? Uh, from the story as opposed to mm. like, you know, blue It's milk. like closure though. Like it, it was the closure you needed, I think, as the reader where it's just like if you lost a loved one suddenly and then you never got to say goodbye and then, you know, you find that like that loved one didn't pass away or something like that, and that you could have those final goodbyes of them and that, you know, that. Hadrian still had something to learn from Tor Gibson, like uh, in uh, I, you know. Go ahead, go ahead, I, I was gonna say I I knew I needed that interaction between yeah. Hadrian and Gibson. I didn't know that I needed that interaction between I, Valker and Gibson. Valka, yeah. I was like, oh my, uh, why are you trying to make me cry? It's like eleven thirty p.m. <laughs> That's exactly why. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's because like you, we know Valka's never going to meet Hadrian's dad, and like Tor Gibson is essentially Hadrian's father, and uh, I think that was like almost um, not what's the word like uh, I'm looking for like when you accept someone into your family and say you know like I'm gonna 
I accept you as part of my family. So I think that's what that, that I really felt like to me when where Tor Gibson accepted Valka and you know it, it's he's introducing his loved one to his father really, and I really loved it. Yeah, well, it's like we said, right? You know, there's not usually a lot of of these human moments in in a lot of science fiction series. Uh, there are exceptions. I'm a big Lois Bujold fan, uh, but uh, uh, I, I I knew I wanted to do that sort of thing. I want uh, stories are fundamentally about people, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we kind of get away from that in speculative fiction. We make it about world building sometimes. We make it about ideas. Uh, even in fantasy, right? Uh, I, I was just complaining. I was at lunch with uh, with some friends and uh, was complaining about how when I used to be an editor, people would pitch their fantasy books to me by starting with their magic system. And I'm not uh, convinced that magic needs to be systematic to begin with. Uh, so I already don't like that that was your first premise. So you're off on the wrong <laughs> foot. But you've talked yeah, yeah. for 10 minutes here, perspective writer, and I don't even know what your main character's name is or what their problems are. And like that's what the book's about. It's not... Like the book is not about Lord of the Rings is not about the ring, right? Yep. It is about Frodo taking the ring to Mordor with these other people, right? And what that and all and all that's entailed with that, right? Um, mm. And 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 you know also just brief note, but but Frodo doesn't actually get enough credit for his role in that either. Just uh, Sam's important, but like if it had been only Sam, they wouldn't have gotten there either because Sam would yep. he would have killed Gollum. Um, <laughs> You know, and so you it, it takes it takes at least two here. Uh, really, it takes three because you need Gollum. But I digress, right? Like it's about, but it's about those relationships, right? Yeah. The story is about is about those people and and what they do. It's not about the ring and how the ring works and why does it turn some people invisible and turn some other people into ring reds and uh, make some other people crazy and want to be king of the world. Like mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. Like don't expl- you don't have to explain that stuff because what matters are the people. And, yeah, like um, I'm, I'm a totally character-driven reader, and uh, like I could, I can forgive a lot of plot stuff, and like the characters really need to speak to me, and uh, yeah, it's just I, I totally agree with everything what you're saying there. Like, you know, you need to, you need to, people need to be attached to those characters, and uh, it's, I, I, I've read a lot of like, I've read a lot of books, and you know, I've read a lot of books lately that have been a big miss for me because of those type of things where the characters were devices for either exposition or um they just they they didn't feel real and i think that's the uh, you know the the goal is to write something that people that resonate with people and i I feel you really do that with this series and uh, i was gonna put a black didn't need any characters childhood's (laughs) end one of the best books ever couldn't tell you a character name in that book still one of my favorites corellin um well yes yeah Um, but I mean, I, I think, I mean, I agree with what you guys are saying though. Like for me, the, the importance of the character is, uh, relative to the time spent on the character. So if we spend mm-hmm. a lot of time with characters, like inside their head, their thought process, their motivations, their opinions, their politics, but I don't find them interesting. I don't engage with them. I don't care with them. That's going to hurt the book. But if it's, I mean, you know, Childhood Ends is like 200 pages, very much focused on on the high concept. You're the lack of, although it, I mean, it does, I'm, I'm exaggerating to make a point. It does have a couple of characters, but the fact that those are relatively thin, that's not the focus for me, doesn't hurt that particular book. But right. if I, if I did, if I wasn't interested in Hadrian, if I, if I didn't care about Gibson, I didn't care about Valka, those moments would not land uh, no, in Sunny. You're just wasting your time. Yeah. I completely agree. Because, um, like, I think I don't know if this is something you said, Christopher, or if someone said, but um, where Hadrian Hadrian Marlowe is is an Anakin like figure, where making the choice to become Darth Vader was the right choice, and it's the choice that needed to be made. I don't know if it's something you said, or is that it's something? Yeah, that's my ten second sales pitch for yeah. customer conventions. Um, so I, I love that pitch. That's and I will say I actually dig high matter swords way more than lightsabers. There's something about lightsabers that just, I don't know, feel like fruity. I don't know. Like they're fruit loopy. Whereas the high matter swords, like they feel like I'm, I'm down for it. I like those. And what was the, uh, was, was lightsabers obviously the obvious inspiration yeah. for those? I wanted to fix lightsabers. Uh, yeah. I love lightsabers. <laughs> I think they're the single like greatest bit of sci-fi tech ever. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, they're visually exciting. You know, they're cool. Uh, they're also swords, you know, which is still like probably the coolest human invention, uh, except for maybe air conditioning. 
Uh, <laughs> but uh, the one thing the Romans not, did not on cool, but uh, I'll take it. Um, uh, Christopher Rocchio likes air conditioning, dislikes Reddit. Ironically, I used a Reddit system to grade oh, no. those two things. That would just rumble me. Um, no, <laughs> I, I, I also I should explain. I I don't I don't like uh, I don't like websites where I can accidentally read about myself uh, because and by accidentally I mean when I succumb to the urge to Google my name or Reddit search my name. And so, uh, you know, that's why I don't, I don't like it, but I digress. Um, uh, no, so it was, it was, it was lightsabers. Cause I, I don't want anyone to feel like I'm attacking them when I say I don't like their favorite website. Uh, is it's just not anyway, uh, not for me, but, uh, you know, it was, it was lightsabers. So I, uh, my dad would make fun of me when I was star Wars kid, uh, you know, uh, for playing with flashlights, right? Is that you realize you've tracked that beam across your face eight times, right? Like you're gonna die because the blade <laughs> has no mass, right? And of yeah, course, yeah. we've like arrived at this place now in, in talking about Star Wars where we're like, oh, well, the Jedi have trained using the Force so that they don't kill themselves with these imbalanced bad swords. Uh, and I'm like, that is a terrible explanation. Uh, yeah. It is absolutely post hoc, uh, you know, it is, it, it's silly, right? Uh, you know, like, just, that's, no, I just don't believe you. That's just bad. It's bad world building. I love Star Wars. Uh, I love lightsabers, but that is a dumb explanation. Uh, and so I was like, what if it just was made of metal and still cut everything? Yeah. Uh, and how do I make that as cool as humanly possible? And so I, I did that because I, um, I've written a short story called The Duelist, which is just about a sword fight with high matter swords. And I have no idea how to make that metal exist or sound plausible. I've put some, you know, uh, I've put like a very thin veneer of science words over how it works because what I'm more interested in is how that technology changes the actual fighting, right? Because mm -hmm. if you've got a weapon that'll cut anything, then you don't need to put any oomph behind a strike, right? And so you can do weird things. Like you can thrust past somebody and they can parry and then you can push the weak of their blade and still cut their head in half, right? Like you can do all sorts of weird stuff. You can stamp with the edge of the blade. Uh, you know, and, and so I wanted to look at how those mechanics changed fighting. As I guess the only thing with, like, with the, having such a powerful weapon, though, is you have to make your, your villains equally as powerful, like, where, you know, you see that in Demon in White, where, um, like, the generals have to have adamant armor, right? And, uh, um, is that, was that because, you know, the enemies of the Cielsen have these high matter weapons that, you know, Syria, is it Syriani Dorietka? has to adapt his army to combat these weapons, right? Yeah, exactly. So, because uh, Sirianni is special, right? Because it has realized, um, it, it, ha it has ambitions. It's not just hungry, like the other the other princes of the Sea Elson. And so it needs, if it, it, it actually wants to wage a war in a way the other ones are just interested in, in raiding, right? It's the difference between, you know, Viking warband leaders and, you know, the Russian czar. Right, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and so he is. He has a lot of. It has a lot of different uh, ambitions, and so yeah, it needs to uh, make these weird alliances with uh, human techno, you know, magicians who build these horrible, you know, uh, cyborg monsters that are sword proof and fast yeah. and have missiles and uh, are generally horrifying and creepy and yeah, and, and turned all of his his you know, most loyal followers into cyborg monsters. Um, I was going to ask uh, on relation to that, because we know in the end of Demon of White that there were six generals that uh, that were created, or that there are six. And, uh, you know, we lose two. He loses mm -hmm. two. How come they don't get replaced? Why does it, uh, in a sense, that uh, he just... Are you sure they don't? That, good point. <laughs> <laughs> Raffo. <laughs> yeah. You'll see. Uh, okay. we'll see. Uh, but good question. Good question. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, no, I, uh, the, what I like about them too, the deer is that it's, there's such like an anime, like a goofy trope, right? Like the, the, the villains got his like six, you know, super generals and they're all very distinctive and weird and creepy, you know, robots. Uh, and so uh, it's just a fun, like sort of Saturday morning cartoon thing to do with your very serious villain. Uh, and so I, I, I like how this is it's sort of like a weird disjunction of, of, of like tone and trope basically. Right. And so yeah. 
I, I, I really like those characters. I was like thinking of them was like they're all they're all unique and different where they I was picturing one day that they all just like turn into like a Voltron type of character where they all like intermute like inter that would be really cool. Uh, <laughs> but I have not I've not done the uh, CL from Megazord. Uh, that is, <laughs> I, I will I will actually spoil that that does not happen. Okay. Uh, that would be awesome. That uh, would be cool. Uh, yeah. uh, it would all be it would be all Bahu Day anyway, right? By mass. Mm. So, um, or would it? Maybe there's a bigger one. Uh, who knows? Um, Ooh, I hope so. <laughs> hey, they were they've all they were all you scary in their own unique ways, and which I, I I did appreciate. And they they present different challenges to like to Hadrian, which you know. Hadrian's a smart guy, and like he's always uh, he, with these these type of enemies, he's always on the back foot, which I I like, and uh, that he's always kind of he's he's always stepping backwards when he's fighting these characters, which is nice. Yeah, well, they're they're yeah, they're really they're really dangerous, and uh, and and that's again that's to compensate for otherwise the the uh, fight scenes are going to all be really close one on one sword duels, right? Like the Bassander fight, or everyone's just dying all the time. Right, because he can mm -hmm. totally handle a regular, you know, mook, you know, no problem. Like, it's sure, just, yeah. Right. You don't uh, even have a name tag. <laughs> yeah, yeah, over. Uh, the author said there were four of you. Um, more like zero. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's absolutely to adjust for, um, for, for the technology. Like I said, right, you know, you want to build your world building uh in to your strengths but in a way that's interesting and so i, I hope that those those scenes are fun for people so i really yeah it always them. feels like like hadrian doesn't get a break and then we have i i like the combination of like the epic scale and then like the personal personal one-on-one -on -one. um yeah, the CL said I, I I saw a couple of people uh, like on Discord rather pro Cielson, which which I, I enjoyed. I like this take. I was like, this is this is a good take. Might not be my take, but I like it because. But that's such a uh, human thing, though, right? <laughs> well, I mean, I you know some people might be trolling or what. No, it's just for fun. But I mean, Probably. to take it more seriously, like Hadrian is kind of constantly trying to learn more about the Cielson, understand them. You know, sometimes he's trying to find peace with them. Sometimes he's like, like battling them, and like we as the reader are kind of going on a similar journey as as Hadrian, trying to make our own decisions about the the Cielson. And there's like been times where I've thought like, yeah, like Hadrian's like the only one that's like thinking about this the right way. And then there's been other times I'm like, ah, we got to get rid of these guys. And then, yeah. and then there's been times where it's like, I have, I think in in a Demon in White, there's he comes across this uh it's kind of what is it like uh basically all these like skull and bones of like humans that like the Cielsons mm, of the shrine the Cielsons yeah have, um, yeah have made into a shrine and he's like i can't believe i ever thought there was like anything more to these people and then like a chapter later the humans are having a parade with like crucified Cielsen <laughs> on the float so i'm like i'm constantly going back and forth on like my opinion of like humans and Cielsen and like the possible like futures for the both of them so is, yeah, it's an interesting ride for the the readers as it is, akin to Hadrian. Yeah, I, uh, I I don't really know like what I can say about that though without uh, without giving away the uh, the farm so to speak. Um, it because it, it is tricky, right? And I don't I don't want it to be easy. Um, you know, I I want you to also be making the choice right as you read the story and and. To know why you're making the choice but i also don't want it to be an easy one because if if and this is true of i think every aspect of of, of the book and of, of any book right if a book is like so easy that like you you don't you know you don't have to struggle with any of its ideas or any of its episodes or or, or content more generally then like why did you read it right mm -hmm. uh you know you, if you could get it because like, the lasers go pew pew well, there is that, right? Like, uh, is that one? Is that one app that like every YouTuber advertises, right? Maybe not in BookTube, but like you can find other other channels where it's like we will, you know, like you can get these fifteen minute synopses of all of these famous books, so that you can, you know, take what you need from them. And then like this is the most like horrific, 
like modern like bullshit I have ever heard, right? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. If, you're, if your book can be reduced, if you honestly think that you can reduce the Iliad or Hamlet or I don't know uh, a, a Stephen Hawking book on astrophysics to 15 minutes, you're insane, mm-hmm. right? Like I, as a as long. a booktuber, this like offends this me. Someone that, someone that enjoys reading this offends yeah. me. I think the potential market for that has to be. Middle schoolers that have a test tomorrow that did not read the book, <laughs> and adults that are appearing on Jeopardy, like the, the, <laughs> trying to like build out your like general knowledge or trivia or something is the only way I could possibly imagine, because that's not fun. Surely that can't be fun. Yeah. yeah, it's not fun. The only exception that I can think of is like if you don't want to watch a horror movie but you want to like pretend you did so people don't think you're a baby, like you could go you could go do that. Yeah. That's Wikipedia is for. I, I don't, I don't know whether it's a service. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't get it, but like if, if your book can actually be reduced to a 15 minute, like sound bite like that, then it's not worth reading. And, um, you know, there's that, there's that line from Dune a bit, the mystery of life being a, a reality to experience. Right. And I think mm-hmm. that, uh, I think that books need to be experiences and not, um, and not, uh, essays. Right. And so, uh, you, you know, I don't want you to get an easy answer about who the bad guys are because i am like i understand why as as the science fiction community has moved on they've gotten sick of alien invasion stories they're like oh the aliens are always the bad guys but we've also gotten to this place where like humans are always bad and the aliens are always misunderstood right and that's like the modern alien story Mm -hmm. these days that's also stupid (laughs) um you know like like uh we can as a fad like any individual one of those right probably awesome uh you know and same with the old ones too right you know i i still like you know day of the triffids or whatever right but uh but like the reality is that if we're looking at some some aliens that are complicated you know and have these rich you know cultural religious you know spiritual scientific lives right but they're also aliens and their brains don't work the same why would it be easy right of course, you know, I wish it were because then my job would be easier. For sure. Um, there are whole sections where I want to not write anymore. But uh, it's like, why did there's I so do many, it? There's so many characters that make it more like, it does make you question, like with, like, is it Tanavar and, and, um, and uh, hopefully I'm saying that right, in Howling Dark, where, you know, when you get a C. Elson on their own, you can, you can have conversations with them and, and humanize them in a sense and have common ground. But then when they're in this, they, when they're in a bigger group where they kind of act like a hive mentality, um, you know, like there, you see the Cialis and like throwing themselves off, you know, uh, or, you know, like kamikaze themselves and like demon and white too. So they're, they're a very interesting species where they, they do have these layers to them where, you know, when they are alone and can be or one-on-one, they can be spoken to. And then, but then when they're the bigger group with their leader and their princes, like they, go into like a hive mind kind of mentality which, which of is... course people do too right oh yeah of course uh and 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 how uh but the sales one are much worse right <laughs> they, they're they much more rigid in their social relationships and things mm-hmm. like that they cannot think outside of their boxes once they're in them uh and so that's part of where that difficulty comes from because there's it's almost like there could be a, another way but but probably not right um, it's probably too late, and it was probably too late, you know, a million years of evolution before. But there's still, like, those little tiny glimpses there, right? And yeah. and I want that to be hard. So. I think it's like, a, a, for me, I can enjoy a story where the aliens are just, from the outset, clearly the bad guys, as long as there is, like, an impending sense of terror, and that, like, plays out in, like, an exciting and rewarding way. And I also like being friends with aliens. An alien pal, that sounds like fun to me. Well, and if it's, I kinda... if I'm trying to figure out somewhere in between, and that's like a complex journey where I, I don't know. It's all, it's all about like, is it for me, Do like in terms of like trends, I don't really mind it which trend like an author picks as long as like you take me on a journey with those mm-hmm. aliens. For sure. One well, thing is like yeah. the Cielsen aren't the only aliens, right? You get the Urchitani yeah. and the aliens on Imesh, like, those are those are great. Like you see, like these, like the ones, like the blundering kind of mindless, like uh, ones that you imagine. I can't remember what they're called. Sorry, Christopher. The Umand, yeah. 
Yes, and then then when you see the Urshtani on like uh, on Godot, and it's just like oh, like these yeah, these are the but aliens. Then you I fall in like. love with them. Yeah, Christopher kills them. Yeah, Listen. some of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. I'm a mean man. Um, Squire, yeah, that's I what I did. For that. He just he deserved kill, better. I kill fake people. Uh, he's <laughs> a hero. All right, Udax is a hero. Uh, Udax is great. I basically killed two of the uh, deer by himself. So I mean, not by himself, but he was he was instrumental. Oh yeah, Twice. we got, we got the we stand list up here. We got we stand Gibson, we stand Udex. <laughs> yeah, no, he's uh, he's he's one of the good ones. But yeah, the, I, I did want to I did want to check all of those boxes, right? Because the 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 answer isn't right. The core, rather, the question isn't like aliens good or aliens bad. It's are these aliens good or bad? Right, uh, you know, and, and are these aliens good in this interaction? Right, like everything's way more complicated than usually a story can give it credit for. And I don't know that I'm, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm giving everything enough shrift, but I am trying to give it more than I feel like uh, these stories often give these questions. Uh, well, I think that's why I really want a Simeon story is because, like, I really love the Urchtani, and I know they're instrumental in in Simeon's character his mythos so that just to see more not just a story a trilogy a trilogy yes (laughs) i don't want to volume i don't want to be greedy yeah Um, but no it's just there's the thing is you built such a world where you could you could do anything within reason that with that with that within that world like you you've got such a vast world that um you you can you could play around with it. And I guess that's one of the things, like looking to the future of Sun Eater, um, you know, how, are you, once this series is complete, are you going to try and write something outside of Sun Eater or maybe look to write, uh, you know, something in universe, but different timeline? Uh, yeah. So the first thing I want to do is a bunch of standalone novels in universe. I don't know how many, I don't know which ones are in which order. I've got about seven or eight ideas. Uh, I don't know that I'll do all of them either. Um, some of them are more distantly connected than others. Some of them involve characters that you already know. Some of them are a thousand years away in either direction or, you know, uh, longer in either direction, let's just say. Uh, and so um, I could basically continue to write in this in this continuity uh, indefinitely. And I think that would be fine if that's all I wanted to do. Um, I do think when those standalone novels come out, they're not going to say Sun Eater on them because I don't want people to feel like they have to buy seven other books to start there. Because the idea uh, is to make more book ones, right? I want to make yeah. more books that new readers can pick up because they might not like purple, right? They may they might be you know like big green fans or something, and so they won't pick up Empire of Silence because it's purple and purples for uh, purples for emperors and we hate those, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I need I need more book ones. I need like a what you know a, what's a what's a what's a peasant color uh, you know green uh, you brown. Know, kind of, <laughs> like, brown yeah yeah if you believe Hollywood's lies uh, <laughs> yeah peasants only ever wore brown and gray and ate mud and yeah thanks Monty Python I love you guys yeah why are you everybody thinks that? <laughs> everybody thinks that's a documentary it's so baffling to me everyone's like yeah <laughs> totally that was what med- medieval England was like no it was freaking Monty Python sketch. Calm down. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh my goodness. Uh, but anyway, um, so no, I want to make some more book ones. You know, give readers some new, uh, you know, places to start. Because then, if they like that book, there are seven other ones they could go check out. Because nothing sells old books like new books. For sure. And, uh, and so, do you, I wanna, do you think those you know, other ideas would be shorter? Because this seems like a silly thing to say within the booktube community because a lot of people they're they're serious readers and they'll pick up a thousand page uh fantasy novel no problem but like i think they start they forget that the average person i mean i I had like a 500 page book with me on a plane the other day and a lady next to me said wow that's a big book i was like yeah i guess it is yeah you're not wrong like yeah a lot of people's like readers instinct would be like huh well i also read the stormlight archive and it's like yes that's great that you can smash through those but the average person especially looking to get into a series a book one something over five six seven hundred pages could be a potential obstacle yeah oh they're absolutely going to be shorter in part because of those those external limitations i think the size that how uh, that um 
Kingdoms of Death is. It was pretty comfortable. It's about 200,000 words. Some of them may even be shorter than that. It just depends on the nature of the story. Because uh, you don't want things to be longer than they need to be. Like, ideally, like, the perfect book has no wasted words, right? Like, it is literally as short as possible. Uh, and I don't know that my books are that. I think they're probably longer than, than you know, if there's at least a the somewhere that doesn't need to be there, right? Uh, I'm not claiming to have really knocked it out of the park and made exactly zero mistakes. But uh, I do think that, that shorter is, uh, is, is going to happen. So uh, I, I think that, and I think that'll be good because I think you want to give people lots of different options. And I think you're right. I think most people look at, you know, um, Game of Thrones and they're like, you know, uh, I liked the show until I didn't, uh, you know, I'm not reading the script. Uh, you know, so uh, too long. I got stuff to do. I know I look at audiobooks sometimes and like 40 hours. Mm -mm, no, I don't, it's going to take me a year because I listen to these things so slowly now. I never yeah. know. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I, want, I do want to shorten them up because um, you can still do a lot in 150,000 words, man. So, um, sure, yeah. So. I mean, I know I'll be, well, I mean, like you've already, obviously, already become an auto buy author for me. Yeah, we're in. Don't, don't let yeah, us stop you don't have you to writing 1,200 us, yeah. page books, Christopher. Uh, I, I would never. <laughs> um, I, 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 do, I do think that longer is probably not going to happen. I think Demon and Light might be the peak. Uh, I don't. Because here's the other thing too, right? Is and this is like a this is like an inside baseball thing, but they'll pay me the same, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so it's actually like dumb if I keep writing these giant <laughs> books because I could do two a year. And the question is, do you want like two hundred and fifty thousand, you know, word books a year and get two like different sets of characters and like different ideas, or do you want like one really big one? And obviously there are people who will answer yay to either of those. Uh, but I think that, that at least doing a phase of shorter books is going to be interesting. Uh, and I'm excited to explore the breadth of the universe rather than the depth. Well, like the one thing I felt with like with Demon and White, because it, it is so big. And like when I got to the dual part, um, and yeah. that's like midway through the book. And I'm like, where the hell else is this book going to go? Because this book is so big. And I'm like... I'm only halfway and like it's already like it's just it's brought me on this roller coaster already and then I just I just I don't know that book didn't fail it, it, it's even though it's such a big book I read it so fast and it feels like a small book in a sense because you just you just devour it because everything is so exciting and uh, this because that, that was the one thing I will say it's like for Empire of Silence I felt the pacing was off in some parts but then in Howling Dark and in Demon in White, your pacing was just <laughs> – don't lie to me, Jonathan. Outline. You're picking up on the outline, but but Jonathan is defending me. He's standing <laughs> standing me, Gibson, Udax, me. Yeah. Book one. <laughs> and book one. But you're uh, – just, again, this that pacing, how you uh, – and it didn't feel like – it felt like every – it needed to be that long to, to have that story, and I, I really – even though it's a big book and I'm actually dreading kind of reviewing it because it's, it, how do you boil, like, how do you boil that type of a book down to 15 minutes and try and do something spoiler free or try and like, and try and tackle it with spoilers too. It's for a spoiler it's, review of Damon and White. Check out what's in time. YouTube. Yeah. Check that well, out. He does Jonathan. a good job of it. He is, uh, Jonathan, is, <laughs> Jonathan is the master of the, the spoiler free review. Um, uh, there was one thing I, I wanted to ask for Demon in White that was yeah. um, that you hinted at. Uh, what was the significance of Harry, uh, like Harry Truman and Horizon's oh. Door being there? I don't know that I want to answer that one. I think it's obvious if you think about it. Um, okay. Uh, but I don't. I don't want to spell that one out. Okay, um, I'll go back and. We'll... I, I I think you can. I think you can pick it up. All right. No. I like that. Okay. Something, something to uh, keep an eye out for on the reread, then. Yeah, uh, I know, I know. It's the thing is like, the thing with it's hard with BookTube where, you know, rereads really hurt your channel or they really hurt your your momentum. And this is a series I obviously do want to reread re and will re real reread for the rest of my life. It's um, it's I don't know. I'm just I'm so ready to just I'm ready to dive back into Kingdoms of Death. Um, but I want to see if we got some more questions got here. Time. Oh, yeah. got there time, was, man. 
I found there's one question we got from uh, Liam over at Liam's Lyceum uh, Hembar is oh. about the found about the Foundation War. Um, is there any interest in exploring that one day? Oh man, that's actually one that I think I shouldn't tell for a couple of reasons. Mm. I think it's more interesting if you don't know everything about it. Uh, not because I think it's not an interesting story, but because I think it's bigger in your head than I could make it. Because mm -hmm. uh, like, is an interesting thing about like uh, about ancient history, right? If you read about and that and that is what this is to them. If you mm -hmm. read about Sargon of Akkad, right, or about uh, you know at Babylon in general, right, you realize that the the Sargon called himself king of the universe, right, and he ruled like half of Iraq. Yeah. Right? And so after this story, if we scale back and we're just looking at like a couple solar systems and like these big sort of like mythical godlike monster robots are suddenly very on the page, they get less scary. Mm, uh, the same saying, way that, yeah. that like if you look at Sargon, king of the universe, and realize that, you know, he is king of a portion of Mesopotamia, then mm. he gets he gets less cool, right? Yeah. Uh, not that he isn't cool. I mean, he's an interesting guy, right? What little we actually know about him. But, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'm hesitant to shrink that story into something that you actually see. And I'm hesitant, too, to look too much at the at the AI directly because I think they're cooler as these peripheral, like, freaky things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also think that it would be very hard to tell that story without being topical. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot closer to our time. and For sure. In incidents that cause uh felsenberg and that cause the uh you know the americani empire and all of these things have their roots in today and i think that if i do that i risk hurting uh you know uh my credibility with my readers because if you are topical at all i think you run the risk of alienating if not half of your readership at least the third at either end of whichever spectrum and I don't want to do that. I, I don't, I, I really consider myself a writer in Tolkien's tradition where the books are not about anything. They are mm. about themselves, right? Like I was on a, uh, another interview and a guy talked about how, you know, he liked that my characters were, you know, really representative and all these things. My characters don't really represent anything. They are themselves. Mm. Uh, they are people. They aren't, you know, the ambassador for, you know, X or Y. They are complicated. And I, because I think that people aren't representative of their groups or, or sure. their nations or anything. I think that they are themselves. And I think that, that we have, a, for as much as our culture reports to mislike labels, we assign them to people with alacrity. And I find that very. False stars. Yeah. That's right. Well, that I, 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 I sidetracked you there, mate. But I was thinking, uh, like, to bring it to connect it to books, we like to say, yeah, the four star. That's a four star book. Oh, yeah. yeah. You're like, well, yeah, Tolkien... it just makes it, it, makes yeah. it easy to, like, mm -hmm. to simplify. It's like we all, we all know it's bad, but we all do it anyway because it's simple. Yeah. 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 I think, um, but I, 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 I don't want the books to be, to be, you know, like about current events by metaphor, yeah. right? Because, because I, I've become there's a bit in that same uh, the same forward in Lord of the Rings where Tolkien says that he uh, he hates you know, allegory yeah he hates allegory uh, you know and he's become very you know uh, you know canny about detecting it right and I, uh, I I feel that way watching like when I go to the movies right I'll pick up something and be like oh I know what this person thinks about this issue. Uh, and like, even if I agree with them, I'm like, I wanted to watch, you know, Spider-Man or whatever. I don't want to be thinking about this right now. Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, I, I, I just don't want it here. Uh, I came to get away from that. And I think that the most useful thing that speculative fiction can do is, is offer people an exit if temporarily from their mm -hmm. lives. And so if you make people look at them, look at their life again, while you're doing that, I think you're missing the point of the story. Uh, or of storytelling generally. There are people, of course, feel differently. They feel that their mission as a speculative fiction writer is to rub your face in the mud. Uh, and that's fine. People like those books, but that's not my books. And um, mm -hmm. and so I think it'd be very hard to tell that story in a way that would make me happy. Uh, as cool yeah. as, as robot monsters are, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. I think well, I, I think probably engage with the... Sorry, I was going to say, ahead, I think John. I probably engage with books perhaps in a in a similar way in the sense that i'm quite the escapist reader so mm. 
I much more enjoy reading about like in-world dynamics than real world. And it, and it can be done well. I'm not saying no one's done it. There's been like great books with great points, great messages that reflect real world things. But cool. often if it's something you don't agree with, you're probably not going to enjoy it. And then, but even if you do agree with it, you're kind of like, well, I feel like I'm getting hit over the head with something that I already agree with. I read mm -hmm. this to escape. So I think it can be done well, but I think yeah. my personal enjoyment is often from like something that is specific to the book. That's why I'm writing, I'm reading this book to experience something unique and original and entertaining outside of my own existence. Right. And, and if, if that's not what you get for me, it's like getting sand in, in like an oyster, right? It's like, ah, ugh, I can hear it in my ears, in my skull, uh, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and now I don't want to watch this movie anymore. Right. Or yeah. whatever it is. And, um, and I think, and I think it would be, I think it would be bad, right? I think that if, uh, you know, I lose a reader because they like, you know, they're seeing the code, right? Then I can't be there to entertain them anymore, and they, and everybody needs to be distracted. Mm. Uh, well, I think it takes you out of the realm of anachronism too, right? Um, that's like one of the biggest things I hate in like modern movies, or like say a, a like a movie that's like representing like ancient one. times is where they put modern sentimentalities on ancient characters right oh my gosh, where yes. and that's where i like about like what's like we, we do with sun eater where I, you like you said you really recognize anachronism and you don't put modern sentimentalities like 2022 modern like sentimentalities on characters that live 16 you know thousand or yeah like fourteen thousand years in the future right and uh it's they're going to be different and they should be different. And I, I, it makes total sense where you wouldn't want to be, you wouldn't want to explore that, that foundation war era. Yeah. Um, I, I do think it would be cool, but I don't know that I could do it justice without, um, without crossing some lines that I don't think I should. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Liam. <laughs> uh, if, if you had to, um, if, if Sun Eater ever, someone ever approached you to interpret Sun Eater into a medium, what would, what medium would you want? movie TV um, show video game uh, i think video game would be the most interesting off the top of my head uh because I, I feel like at this point we've reached a sort of like market saturation with regard to television and film and speculative fiction fantasy certainly more than science fiction i don't know that like i think it would help sales right but i don't know that i would like necessarily stick out enough to to make a big difference and i think um i think that um frankly I think there may be more people who play a video game seriously these days than who go to the theaters seriously. Uh, not that people don't like, like, not that people don't go to the box office, but they go to the box office to watch loud explosions for a couple hours and they go home. I think that Martin Scorsese's critique of modern cinema is essentially correct. That's not to say I don't like superhero movies. I just saw the Batman, uh, you know. But I, which I also think that movie escapes some of these problems, but. Um, but I do think that like, there's a lot more rabidity in, 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 uh, in video game culture than there is in watching movies anymore in terms of, you know, just how engaged fans are. Uh, and I also think you could do interesting things too. We're talking about like the sort of pliable historical nature of, of things, right? And if you were to play, say a Witcher style RPG about Hadrian, mm -hmm. you can make choices that, you know, oh, did they happen? Right. Uh, or right. Or are we looking at like other, you know, potential, you know, time states and things like that. Right. Uh, cause in addition to the historical plasticity of, of the universe, right. There are, are also, there's some weirdness with time and memory, uh, and things that get involved as well. So I think you could do cool stuff with that and with Hadrian's sort of abilities in, in, in gameplay in a way that you couldn't really with film. I think that'd be an interesting thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to be Valka, and movie. I want to shoot stuff. Uh, there you go. You know, the latest to go pew pew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Awesome. Yeah, no, I think it'd be cool. Uh, I think it'd be really cool. Uh, I know a lot of people were talking about it on, like, Mike's Discord with uh, where, like, a loading screen would be just you sitting in fugue, right? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That is That's still cool. terrifying to me, fugue. That is... It's a big risk. How much trust you must have to put on anyone that you would go into this box and then wake up successfully. Right. Go into the box, have all of your blood flushed out and replaced with uh, another fluid uh, frozen uh, for 30 years at a time, and then have your blood reintroduced 
Uh, and yeah, no, no, I, I would never do it. Are you kidding? <laughs> no, uh, I'd do, do it. Just give me the numbers. If they tell, if as long as they tell me, yeah, ninety nine point nine eight percent of people survive. But uh, those numbers are pretty good. Throw yeah, it, the numbers are pretty up. good at this point. I mean, as a matter of course, right? The empire will freeze people by the millions and just retain them for future colonization projects, right? Like it's a pretty stable technology, but like it still is like it's like terrifying. you do feel like you're drowning when you are put into it. So like it's not fun. It's uh, probably like flying. Like, but I'm sure flying was terrifying a hundred years ago. Yeah. But now, now everyone will get on a plane. Jonathan, oh, we'll, you see, like, we'll the, be hopping in fugue. No, no, no problems, mate. You see, like you'd be the guy who'd walk around the fugue containers, like drawing mustaches on the uh, like. <laughs> on the glass of the few container or like Watch an eye patch. <laughs> I should do that. That's a Lorian move. <laughs> that was totally a Lorian move, yeah. I will uh I should do that. I should do that. You'll have to you'll have to like you know write me in somewhere maybe. <laughs> yeah if I steal that you'll know. Okay. Uh, you'll know. Well yeah uh we have a couple more patron questions I want to make sure it I don't yeah, let's see here. I, I wrote a few down here. Um, okay, favorite and least favorite moment to write for each book. Maybe we maybe you can limit it to like if you want to if you want to see a book. Uh, favorite ever is the Coliseum Sword Fight in Demon in White. Uh, I have planned I planned that scene since I was a kid because I thought catching a lightsaber would be surprising and cool, uh, <laughs> and I wanted to do that, and so. There are a few scenes in the series where, like, I got to it. And I'm like, oh, it's finally, like, my time has come. Uh, and that was really the king of them because I just thought it was a fun sequence and I thought it would be awesome. Uh, as far as least favorite goes, uh, I mean, there's, like, least favorite, like, tedious, like, basically, like, any sort of, like, council, like, conversation chapter is hard to write. There are a lot of people speaking. It's hard to keep track. Like, these aren't... Those aren't like fun to write. And I'm not one of those authors who says like, if you're not having fun writing it, don't write it. Cause like sometimes like you just don't want to write the thing that's next. And, uh, and so those chapters are sometimes hard. Uh, but like actual like unpleasantness is probably the negotiations, the end of Pal and Dark. Uh, they're just mm -hmm. complicated to try and like understand the linguistic differences and things like that. It's not easy. And I wanted that to be over very badly. <laughs> Um, I, those those are really touch, like those are really key moments though in the book where you really start to realize how alien the Cielsen are and how like their like their evolution is completely different from ours and so I know they probably yeah you said they were tedious but I really I know we needed them as a reader for sure yeah yeah well that's part of what I mean right people say like don't write the scenes that make you unhappy but like I had to right like those are <laughs> like those are just not those are not uh skippable right and they're they're also not easy and sometimes i bet like, those people don't eat vegetables yeah they probably don't they're like you can just eat cake and, and yeah. like, <laughs> you take a multivitamin you're fine <laughs> oh, la, la. <laughs> you don't even have to taste that uh, yeah no yeah exactly that's, see, that's see yeah, um oh here is one um does your family read the books and if so what do they think uh, so yeah, they do at least, um, most of them. My wife does not, uh, which is actually cool with me. Cause I know a couple writers whose spouses are their biggest fans and that's a weird dynamic, man. Like that's a, that's a weird dynamic. I actually and... recently heard of this cool thing that could be a help to it. It's a 15 minute summary of a book. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got YouTube videos on my channel. She could pretend like she knows. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not really her thing anyway. She's more of like a, you know, like a romance reader, mostly a uh, reality TV show watcher. So uh, not really her thing. Uh, but my, uh, my daughter, Bachelor Nation. Yeah, yeah. 90 Day Fiance. That's her jam. <laughs> uh, which I have not written. So, uh, you know, anyway. Um, uh, but my brothers have both, uh, both read it. Um, and they're both, uh, they're both big, like audiobook guys. It's kind of how they do their reading. So. Mm -hmm. uh so they both they both like it a lot um and uh my brother is reading dune now or he actually i think he just finished he went all the way through chapter house god bless him uh oh, and uh because oh man those last two were rough uh <laughs> but uh, i love the first four man but holy cow anyway um uh, and my and my parents have both read them as well. It was one of the coolest things in all of this. The risk of being a little too sentimental. My dad had never really taken it that seriously until I sold the books, and then as soon as I did, he's been kind of my sort of biggest supporter, and that's been really nice. 
That's uh, awesome. Yeah, it's really cool. Because uh, he is not remotely like Hadrian's dad, despite the fears of booksellers everywhere. Uh, like, oh, yeah, my parents are telling me, I'm like, your dad? And I'm like, he's fine. Like, <laughs> the guy Barnes Noble was like, is your dad based on, like, no, no, no. No, no. good, good. Yeah, that's good. I, I don't think I could ever get my dad to read a book. Like, my dad would be like, books are for coloring, not reading. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's part of my dad's thing. Like, like he, he's not a big reader at all. He read, to, he read to us when we were little, but uh, for himself, nah. Not really. His his hobbies are a lot more haptic and practical, right? Like the woodworking behind me is all him, right? Oh wow, he does good he work. That's awesome. Him. I did the finishing, but he did all the all the actual, you know, construction and stuff. So, like, it's just you know, reading not really his thing. But he's read my books and and he's a big supporter, which is really cool. Uh, my great. mother, on the other hand, is a big big fancy wonk. So, uh, she you know, I made me you know watch Highlander and Beastmaster and. You know, <laughs> All those '80s fantasy movies growing up, which were a big influence, and so, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, I had a Highlander moment in this book. Like, uh, there's totally one. I don't remember what it is, but I guarantee oh, you. Like, you're right. When I was thinking about like my one of my my favorite band of all time is Queen, and nice. uh, you know, there's I don't know I I like I play a lot of Queen for my kids, and I, I played Who Wants to Live Forever by Queen, and then I'm reading like Hadrian and Valka, and I'm like. I'm not gonna cry like when I'm reading it because and that's totally from Highlander too like that whole scene where it's like who wants to live forever and that it's that that romance between them and it's just so oh yeah. it gets yeah. me like so one of the the series of Easter eggs that nobody's ever talked to me about is there were a lot of minor characters that were named after rock musicians uh oh, really? and so Lord Haran Bulsara Bulsara was Freddie Mercury's actual last name uh, oh, and wow, so, okay. so there are a lot of little little nods like that, right? There's a there's a Halford and, and there's an Oliva and and, uh, and some other people as well. because uh, usually like there's usually a joke or a reference involved with basically every name that's not like a one off peasant character. Okay. So, <laughs> uh if if you look, there's usually an explanation. Uh I won't explain all of them. But uh, there's usually a story. But there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of I mean there's a lot of rock and roll references in the books mm. too, right? A lot of chapter titles are are Black Sabbath or Rainbow references in some way. I do like uh, that. To, add that to the reread notes, Dan. Yeah, well, I found a lot of like references too. Like uh, I remember I was talking to you about like oh I found uh, like do androids dream of electric sheep when you mentioned the owls in Howling Dark and uh, um, I think there was a Monte Cristo. Is there a count of Monte Cristo reference in Lesser Devil with the almost. Priest? Oh, uh, oh, with uh, with Laurent, uh, he's not supposed to be Abbe Faria or anything like that. Mm, okay, it's not to say there's not a Count of Monte Cristo reference in there. I, I yeah. love uh, um, so I, I can't even remember where all these things are buried at this point. Um, uh, I remember so, when we, I think Jonathan was, it was Jonathan who told me he's like, oh yeah, like I think Rockio references uh, like Karate Kid, Star Wars, and Game of Thrones, and like the first like chapter of the book, and I'm like. No, he doesn't. And I go back and read. I'm like, holy shit, he does. <laughs> yeah. Well, I so like I'm of two minds about this, right? Like on the one hand, there's like the narrative explanation, which is that some of this stuff is kind of sunk into the like background cultural consciousness, right? Like we mm -hmm. say things, and I'm struggling to think of an example right now on a daily basis that are Shakespeare references that nobody knows are Shakespeare references, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's all Greek to me, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, or my salad. When in Rome, day. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, that's a yeah. That's People a. Say a or b. I say to be or not to be. Right. Exactly. Just, just, just a common thing that we all say that well, I that we could all collectively agree, and that was, you know, well, that was relatable to everyone, right? But Shakespeare invented the pun too, which you know, you like he invented the pun, which should stand for punch him in the goddamn mouth. But, um, like, uh, <laughs> but. You know we can't get away from puns and like you know there are puns a little bit in in uh, like in any kind of any work of writing right or fiction especially and no i do actually really appreciate it and i think someone who isn't as well read as like someone who is like a booktuber wouldn't catch all these references and i think that's totally fine to put them in there and, yeah and i don't expect anyone to catch all of them either because they're really idiosyncratic and some of them are really weird uh and only like i am going to know some and that's totally fine. 
right? Uh, but the other thing, right, because like, like I said, like there's a certain degree to which these things are just in the universe now, thousands of years later. Because like people will even like, you know, people will reference like, like Gilgamesh will come up sometimes in some way or other, right? Uh, you know, in pretty limited contexts, but uh, not like the Shakespeare quotes, but uh, like the, these things will turn up thousands of years later. And so I don't think it's weird if some little fragment has survived, even though nobody knows what the source is anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, like, because if I get one consistent thread of criticism, it's that I uh, show my influences too, obviously. But I feel like not to do that is to be disingenuous. I feel like by referencing them explicitly, I'm mm -hmm. citing them. Right. Like, I feel like that's actually how you do a work cited in a creative writing story yeah. is, to, is to directly acknowledge these things and not hide from them. Because we have this fetish for originality and speculative fiction, but that's not what culture is. Culture mm -hmm. is the great conversation. Right. It, it's 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 all of these, you know, artists and, and writers and storytellers and stonemasons and whatever, you know homaging like these ideas because it's those ideas it's that story that is the culture in the first place right mm -hmm. so if everybody is atomized and can't reference things because they're owned by corporate entity x or you know writer y then we don't have a culture at all uh, sure. well that's why we started writing right because yeah. it used to be an oral culture right where we you know you look at the ancients where they would just they would be able to recant the iliad and the odyssey and the reason we wrote things down is so that we can remember and and humans by nature are storytellers and i think it's like you, you know you, you're copying not copying but you're you're taking influences from somewhere and that's human that's to be human right that's yeah a, that's and, a hipster and, criticism like i mean hyperion's basically just a love letter to john keats and it's one of the best things ever written it's 100 uh, yeah. yeah i think people can I mean, can resent you just listing stuff. I mean, if you're just referencing it to be like, "Hey, did you guys like this song too?" Then okay. If it's but if it's like done with love and a, mm, and an intention yeah. to improve the story that you're telling, and and you you've taken something and like improved upon it or worked to, it worked it in, in an original way, I I think that's like reflective of like you. Like the story that you want to tell you you as a person your experience and i think i think most people are like that it's only when it's like it doesn't serve much of a purpose i think it'll maybe rub people the wrong way yeah i think i think that's right um i uh i just felt like it should be mentioned right because i i do uh, i i do get a little frustrated when people misunderstand they're like oh that was a star wars reference and he thought we wouldn't notice like no you're supposed to notice and you were supposed to know that i know right that like yeah. obviously lightsabers existed right or whatever yeah. right like i don't think that i am creating stuff whole cloth because like no but no writer creates anything whole cloth right like yeah. like even if you like like i made up a language right if the whole book was in that made up language that language is still like i told you based on japanese and latin right like, <laughs> yeah. like nobody can create anything from from nothing right that is that, like mm. it's a law of nature right and so yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so I, 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 uh, I feel like I should explain myself sometimes, but anyway, um, you yeah. Just tell them to go pound sand, like, <laughs> to... yeah, uh, or don't log into Reddit, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, anyway, cause, cause it's the other thing too, right? Like we, we live in a time when like a lot of writers want to like argue with their readers and like, oh, you didn't understand. I don't want to do that. That's not cool. Yeah. Right. But it's still like it's hard not to when you see someone be you know be wrong on the internet not to argue with them right mm. as, the, as the as the old meme goes uh, there's an XKCD comic yeah I can't come to bed someone's wrong online uh, well I think that's I think that's with anyone though like to put yourself out there mm -hmm. like you know with with yourself being an artist and then even Jonathan Jonathan and I having like videos like you know we we experience a lot of like weird comments or rude comments or people are telling us we're idiots and stuff like that and I think um not you me know, not you eh <laughs> I, I, I don't know what, i don't know what you've been posting <laughs> oh man i've had some i've had some real comments but um i think that's you know that's part of creating anything where um if you if you're not if you if you're gonna please you're never gonna please everyone and i think the ability to um to be okay with that and to you know you're gonna make some enemies in life and that's how life works i think totally Totally. Um, and, and I'm also not trying to please everybody, right? Mm -hmm. We have the sense that, like, 
every you know story or work of art or product should be for everybody. I think that I think that Sun Eater could be for anybody, but if it's for everybody, then it ends up being this sort of like focus tested nightmare that has nothing to offer. You know, it's it's the vitamin, right? It's it's not you know that's not vegetables, and uh, you know. Uh, you know, I want people to, uh, have a nutritious, you know, story breakfast and, you know, maybe some people don't like scrambled eggs and that's fine, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I want to be the best scrambled eggs I can make. So Christopher can probably speak to this better than we can seeing as he's kind of put his work out there on a, on a larger scale. But I have a, a, a friend of mine who has a. A YouTube channel, channel uh, Johnny Tuchelos. He um, talks about um, animated shows, and he has over two hundred thousand subscribers. And one day he looked like a bit annoyed or something. I said, "What's wrong?" He said, oh, "I had a, like a couple like negative comments on this video." I said, "Well, what, what's it like doing overall, like in terms of like the like to di dislikes?" He's like, "Oh, that's good. It's like ninety nine point something." And I said, "Like, imagine a movie came out and you go to like the Rotten Tomatoes or whatever, and 99% of the critics, 99% of the, the audience liked it. What would you think? He's like, oh, it's probably an awesome movie. And I'm like, well, then you probably made an awesome video. Like yeah. once you reach enough people, you can't please everybody. So as long as you're happy and you're getting mostly positive feedback, you can't, you can't let like th three comments or whatever oh. it was get yeah. to you. <laughs> totally. Uh, and you have to go to you have to go to whatever measures you know you need to 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 keep yourself sane, right? Uh, and and uh, you know to be honest, I've had very little problems, right? You know I, I think basically everybody likes the books and that's awesome. I wanna I wanna keep everybody happy because that is my job. Uh, I want everyone to have the story they didn't know they wanted to read, like I said, right? Uh, but I. Uh, it means a lot to be able to to entertain people and to have people care about this nonsense that I made up, right? Because <laughs> that's all it is, right? Uh, you know, that's all it is. And to have people feel like that matters is a, is a real privilege, right? And uh, and that's been really cool. And uh, and yeah, I I love this job, and I hope I can keep doing it, you know, forever. So, so do we have a lot yes, keep keep doing it man because even though it is it, nonsense in a way that it's made up i think it has like real world impacts on people in, in terms of just whether it's something small like brightening their day or you know that it, it gives them a, a way to think about relationships or you know their own journey or their motivations it just gives them like you know peps them up in some way it's like you know, art in, in it, it's all its various forms is having like real world impacts, even though it's all just at the end of the day. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> so keep, keep doing, know, what, keep doing yeah. what you're doing. It's so, it's so true though. Like, I mean, that, and that's why I wanted my wife to read it so bad. So I have someone in my household who I can talk to about it. Cause like we, we both love Sanderson. We've read a lot of Sanderson. And uh, I said, this guy's my sci-fi Sanderson. Like this, like you need to read this because I want you to. I want to discuss this with you, right? And um, and I think that's just you. And I'm even looking to forward to like when my kids like get older, like because I, I have a lot of books in my house. I have like shelves of books, and like we're always reading physical books. And that, you know, my kids came up to me one day like, Dad, like I want to read something great. I'm like, like here you go, right? And you you build these connections with people, and like. All the meaningful conversations I found I've had in my Discord are discussed, like have been mainly discussing Sun Eater because there's a lot of Sun Eater fans now in my in my Discord channel, and just um, like one of the one of my uh, Kristen, he's one of the he's a big fan of yours. He's I think he's read you since Empire Sounds first came out, and was him you know, watching me go through the experience of reading Empire of Silence and all the other other books. And he was waiting for me to hit these moments so we could talk about it. And I, I think that's like, you know, you he, even though he's already read it, he's seeing other people enjoy it, which is just as good. It's like re enjoying it again for yourself for the first time. And, and uh, you know, really appreciated, uh, like appreciative of you to write such a, like a great story. And I can't thank you enough that uh, like this whole year has been sun eager for me because I started Empire of Silence only in January and I've, I've demolished these books and I absolutely love them. And I, I, I wish my platform was bigger so that I could scream it from the, like the mountain that, uh, that you need to read these books. 
I appreciate that, and I'm grateful to the both of you and everybody who's been. His people have been really supportive, especially in the last year or so, and that's been really cool. Um, and I, uh, I think it's going to be a good year. It's going to be a great yes. the year. Twenty twenty two, year of the sun eater. Yeah. Ah, they said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to ask a question that everyone's always asked to to put a gun to your head, Christopher. Okay. What is your favorite cover art? Oh, of the whole series. Um, mm. I th I think I think Howling Dark Ashes of Man is up there. That may be yeah. recent bias. It's hard to know. Uh, but I am I'm holding out because I should be. Uh, we should be working with Kieran on the Queen of Mid Ashes Collector's Edition here in the next uh, next couple of weeks. So is that going to uh, be with Anderita? Yep. Yeah, it's going to be just like the last one. Uh, so I, uh, I'm, I'm holding out. I don't know what we're going to put on it just yet, but I'm, I'm hoping that that will be another contender. Do Are they going to be potentially reprinting? Date for that one? Oh Was yeah. That? A, release, a release date would be cool if you had something. Gonna be, that's going to be like September, October ish. Okay. Don't have it just I'm, yet. I'm sure you'll have a lot of updates I for mean, us when, uh, that yeah, we need to know official. that there, there's only 500 copies last time. So. Uh, I, know, on the I, I was going to ask if they would do a reprint of the the lesser devil because like i love that like i love that um that copy but i would love to get my hands on that to the uh, the one you have uh, jonathan how much you want for it <laughs> well uh, I'm, I'm, check, I'm, video. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding i'm not selling i'm not selling no good man no well it's like i said like i that empire of silence hardcover was so hard to get i, I luckily have two because i'm going to be giving one away uh once i hit a thousand subscribers to someone on my channel but it's it's um it's such a it's i wish your publisher would you know publish republish or reprint the hardcover for uh Thank your book you. uh, i'm i'm hoping at least we might get a trade paperback soon but mm. uh, i have been trying to convince them there are some you know, uh, like those external factors. For sure, involved. yeah. On, on, a lot of supply so. chain issues. Yeah, yeah, that's part of it, and um, and it's it's hard too, right? Because publishers can't just print, you know, a hundred for the hundred people who are asking. They got to print yeah. at least, you know, a couple thousand. A couple thousand. And so they yeah. need to see that the the momentum's there, and and as the books are picking up and they are picking up, maybe things will change. Yeah, I know a lot of people have been speculating about like a special edition ever for Empire of Silence. And if that was ever to be done, what would be something you'd love to see on the special edition? Uh, I want to see Hadrian's illustrations. Uh, would be oh, oh. Really oh like, that'd be good. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I don't know how he could pull that off, but uh, but that would be cool. There would um, be some saucy ones in there too, especially of Valka. Uh, well, no, might, respect, might, respectful, of course. Respectful, we, yeah. We might, we, we might elide that one respectfully. Hadrian is, is very protective of Balka for sure. Uh, so he might not he might not put the saucy stuff in there <laughs> for his own collection. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think illustrations would be cool. Um, and we do want to do that. Uh, and Derrida Books and I have been talking about doing that after oh, next cool. couple of years. Maybe after the series is done, we might start rolling those out. Mm. Well, well, I do just, appreciate I'm what getting authors... weepy thinking about how nice the paper is in this limited edition. Oh. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, you That's did say that. Good nice. stuff. <laughs> well, I do appreciate you thinking about making like special editions, like once a series is complete, because that is one thing I don't like to abide by is where authors do come out with uh, like special editions and they haven't picked or finished a book in twelve years, and uh, so I uh, not to you know. Shot, shoot any shots, but I have no um, idea what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah, we're looking at we're looking at doing that. That's cool. Um, so we got some we got some cool ideas for for well, things like that in the future. For Queen of the Ashes, though, what uh, what would you combine with that? Because I know it's I have it back there in. Um, at well, Sword it's going to be it's going to be that with the stories from Tales Volume Two. Uh, okay. So, there, so Tales Volume Two, and that's maybe we end on this note because uh, you yeah, got yeah, King we'll... Death coming out on March twenty second. Um, I said you've got a link in the description, probably. I will, yeah. Uh, but then uh, beginning of April, I will be putting Tales Volume Tales of the Sun Eater Volume Two up for pre order. It'll be out on June first, but it is uh, six stories. It's the Dragon Slayers, uh, Fire in the Sky, Kill the King, Knowledge, uh, Good Intentions, which is a Valka point of view story. And um, Before Devils, which is another Crispin story. 
Wow. Um, okay. That one's original. Um, so it'll be those six stories plus Queen of Mid Ashes for the next special edition. That'll be out later this year. And that'll also include a short history of House Marlowe essay that I am working on right now, very slowly. You're spoiling us, Christopher. This is um, like, uh, there's no doubt that 2022 is the year of the Sun Eater with. <laughs> with all these amazing uh, things you're dropping on us here. It's going to be a while before I can get two books out a year again, I think. So this is a, it's a big year for sure. Um, Great. Yeah. We love it. We're, we're excited, and uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, quite a long time, but hopefully it was an enjoyable time, Christopher. We really, uh, really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, no, Talking really appreciate you. you taking the time to speak with us and uh, just have us gush about your books. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we wish you... The biggest success on March 22nd with uh, Kingdoms of Death. Uh, awesome. Again, I will have a review for Kingdoms of Death out uh, probably on the week, the Tuesday before the release. So uh, everyone, you know, make sure you're pre-ordering the book. And if you uh, if you if you haven't pre-ordered it, read Sun Eater and start the series of Empire of Silence. So uh, won't, we won't say any more, and I guess we will uh, we'll end it there. So thank you guys so much, Jonathan, for being a part of this, and Christopher for uh, for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Thank you.